Good thing I cut off the first part. Good evening. Good evening. This is the uh, District 20 board meeting, and I am going to call it order to order right now, please. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Here. Mr. LaValle? Here. Mr. Lundberg? Here. Mrs. Reynolds? Here. Mr. Tembe? Here. Board members, you should know that your screens, big screens and the screens in front of you are not working this evening. So if you need, you need to have your board docs up for sure in order to follow along with presentations. Moving on to agenda item 6B, we're going to have the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Um, we'll be led by the board. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Item 7A, approval of the agenda. Ms. Sadat, are there any updates to the agenda? There were updates to the agenda and the board was notified of these. Members of the board, are there any items you wish to move from the consent agenda? Seeing none, are there any items to be added to the agenda? Again, seeing none, may we have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger? Aye. Mr. LaValle? Aye. Mr. Lundberg? Aye. Mrs. Reynolds? Aye. Mr. Tembe? Aye. I, I need to back up, you guys. I just realized I wanted to make, a, in deference to a presenter this evening, wanted us to consider moving item 12C. Um, the naming of Building B at Air Academy High School prior to 11 A E L 2.7 employment compensation benefits that will change our agenda. So I'm going to need another motion, please. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mrs. Cloninger. Aye. Mr. Lavalley. Aye. Mr. Lumberg. Aye. Mrs. Reynolds. Aye. Mr. Tempe. Aye. Thank you, board. Moving on to agenda item eight. It's the board quote, and I'm going to give this over to Colonel Johnson. Well, good morning. It's uh, it's good to see you all. Uh, it's been a while. Uh, thanks for your patience with me. Um, I appreciate the boards uh, giving me the opportunity to provide this evening's quote. Um, I, I don't have the slides in front of me, so I'm going to trust our IT specialist to kind of guide me through this. So uh, you should be seeing a, a picture of uh, Booker T. Washington. Um, Booker T. Washington said, education is not a thing apart from life, not a system, nor a philosophy. It's a direct teaching how to live and how to work. Uh, Booker T. Washington was an educator um, and the founder of Tuskegee Institute. Uh, he also served as its first president from 1881 to 1915. The institute will later become known as Tuskegee University. Uh, we go to the next one. Tuskegee, Alabama is known for several, th several things, perhaps most inf infamously uh, for the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the experiment, I, I uh, encourage you to, to do some research on that. Tuskegee, Alabama is also famously known as the birthplace of our nation's Tuskegee Airmen. African-American pilots and ground crew who trained at Moton Field there at Tuskegee, Alabama breaking down barriers of racial segregation and injustice. The Tuskegee Airmen would go on to serve valiantly in World War II, flying, fighting, and winning numerous engagements over the skies in the European theater of operation, arguably becoming the most revered and feared group of American pilots by the German Luftwaffe. Perhaps the most well-known of the Tuskegee Airmen was the first commander of the 332nd Fighter Group, a great American patriot and hero Colonel Benjamin O. Davis Jr., West Point class of 36, who would also go on to become the Air Force's first black four-star general. General Davis retired from active duty in 1970 in the rank of Lieutenant General. It wasn't until 1998 that he was promoted to the rank of general. The general was a humble and servant leader, a figure who we affectionately refer to as, 
an airman's general. In November of 2019, your Air Force Academy renamed its airfield in honor of General Davis and the Tuskegee Airmen he represents. It also exemplifies the path they forged for so many others to serve our great nation. If we go to the next slide. Five years ago, your Air Force Academy started the Air Power Legacy Series to honor the Air Force's rich history. In those five years, the football team has worn special uniforms to honor, the, to honor World War II flying, flying Tigers, the F-35 Lightning II, the AC-130 Gunship, and the C-17 Loadmaster. Last year, the team honored the Tuskegee Airmen with the donning of the Red Tails uniform for its games against service rivals at West Point and Annapolis. And those of you who are in the room today, I brought some static displays here to, to show you what those, uh, what those uniforms look like. The bravery, courage, and resilience of General Davis and the Tuskegee Airmen represent all that is dear to the Department of the Air Force and embodies our core values of integrity first, service before self, and excellence in all we do. Thank you again to the board for giving me the opportunity to provide this evening's quote. Thank you, Colonel Johnson. You taught me some things I didn't know, and I, you should know that even though we couldn't see that in here, people in the atrium could see it, and it was live on our screen, and we have five people attending there as well. So thank you for the slides as well to support that. Nice job. I'm going to move on to uh, public comments. Mrs. Cortez, do we have anyone signed up to speak to the board this evening? Thank you, Mrs. Cortez. I'm going to move on to board comments then, and I will begin with Mr. Lundberg, please. Thank you. Happy to be here. That is all. I turned my mic off and you went too fast. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lundberg. Mr. LaValle. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. I just have a couple brief, uh, brief things. I'm going to sound like a broken record here. I remotely attended the last parent academy that. Why don't you hold on a second, Mr. LaValle? OK. Are we good? OK, Mr. LaValle, go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. Um, I attended the, the latest parent academy dealing with vaping, and, and I sound like a broken record, but it was excellent, uh, like every other one has been excellent. And I, I just want to urge and encourage all parents, if you're hearing this, to at least look at, at the schedule to see if perhaps you ought to maybe listen to to one or more of these uh, parent academies. They're just so good. I um, I just I just can't say enough good about them. This was an, an also an excellent one. And I also attended a, a virtual CASB workshop dealing with uh, legislation, legislative assembly, and it was excellent. I did. I couldn't make the second one, um, but it but it was really good. So um, that's all. I'm just glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. LaValle. Ms. Cloninger. Um, I also wanted to say that um, <clears throat> I agree with the Parent Academy um, plug. I have had some schedule change, so I can't make them at that time, but they are also all um, recorded. So that is another thing to um, take advantage of is to go back and listen to those recordings if you can't make the actual day. Um, <clears throat> I also attended the CASB um, legislative um, conference. We've had kind of our last couple of Mondays and, and next Monday um, where we will be doing work with CA or, you know, be part of seminars with CASB and I just thoroughly enjoy it. It may be boring to some, but I just, I learn a lot from it each time. Um, it makes me appreciate being a part of that group. And then also I just was super appreciative of the, um, work that um, our schools have done um, and we saw a couple of the um, spotlights today from Pine Creek and Chinook Trail Elementary and I just I enjoy every single minute that I get to be around the kids in this district. I think that um, they are resilient and and give me a lot of hope for numbers and things that we'll hear about tonight. <laughs> so anyway, I am grateful to be here. Thanks. Thank you, Mrs. Cloninger. Mr. Temby. Um, I too attended the uh, CASB uh, virtual legislative uh, session uh, where we heard from a couple of members of the State uh, Board of Education 
and uh, somebody from the National School Boards Association uh, who handles legislative affairs. So that was very interesting. Um, attended parent sounding board uh, this week. And again, great, uh, great group of parents and uh, uh, people who go out and spread the word about uh, the uh, district and bring it back to that forum and share it with our superintendent who does a great job. And uh, thoroughly enjoyed Spotlight uh, tonight. I was incredibly impressed <laughs> with the speaker uh, uh, featured uh, from Pine Creek uh, High School. That is a very poised young man. And uh, uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Temby. Colonel Johnson. Colonel Johnson has nothing else to share this evening, at least right now. Thank you. Um, I would just like to again, and, and ditto my colleagues, thanking Chinook Trail and Pine Creek High School for a great spotlight this evening. I just, we haven't been able to see students in person um, at our spotlight, but they do such a fine job of sharing them with us um, by video and the work they're doing. So I appreciate that. I also want to thank the board and Mr. Gregory for um, seven hours of uh, a work session um, today. And we've been here since 11 o'clock. So if you think our session, our comments are short, they probably will be this evening. We have 14 attendees currently. And I want to thank the 14 attendees who are here. And something tells me as soon as we get through our consent agenda, that number might go down again. But nevertheless, um, thank you um, for you for 14 attendees for being here with us. Um, we also have many people in the atrium tonight because of our consent agenda item that you will all hear shortly. And I'm going to go to administrative comments, Mr. Gervey. Yes, Dr. Peak, please. And friends. Let's try that again. Good evening, everyone. I'm pleased this evening to introduce three individuals for administrative positions. Each candidate meets all state licensing requirements and school district prerequisites. As you know, each candidate has also competed our rigorous process for achieving this recommendation, including paper screening, pre-screening interviews, preliminary interviews, final interviews, and professional reference checks. We're delighted that many applicants showed interest in the three positions, and I want to thank the teachers, support staff, administrators, parents, and students who took time from their other obligations to participate throughout the various parts of these interview processes. So first, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Jamin Pariso, who is being recommended as the new Director for College and Career Services, and I believe that Jamin is pictured uh, with, uh, I think, do we have an image up? Yes, okay. Uh, Jamin is pictured with his wife, Sarah, and uh, from oldest to youngest, which I think is also height from left to right. Uh, Jacob, 16, Cole, 13, Evan, 11, and Echo, and she's nine. Dr. Jamin, per Pariso holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in History from the University of California in Santa Barbara, a Master of Education from the University of Laverne in Laverne, California, and a Doctor of Education in Educational Leadership from Liberty University in Lynchburg, Virginia. Jamin began his educational career in Delano, California as a high school social science teacher, where he also coached track and field and JV football. He then served as an athletic director an assistant principal of curriculum and instruction, and a director of teaching and learning. Jamin also served in the Salia, California, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing, as an assistant principal of supervision and engagement, assistant principal of curriculum and instruction as well. Currently, Jamin serves as a director of college and career readiness for the Vesalia Unified School District. He has been he has won numerous awards, served on several committees, and written several publications. We are pleased to present Jamin to you tonight for the position of Director for College and Career Services. And at this time, I would invite, if Jamin is able to share briefly, just a few comments with you. Thank you, Dr. Peek. Uh, good evening, Board President Reynolds, Academy District 20, Board Members, and Superintendent Gregory. 
I really look forward with excitement and gratitude for this opportunity to work with all of you and Dr. Field in serving the students in Academy District 20. My wife and our four children are not only excited to relocate to beautiful Colorado Springs, but to also be part of an amazing school district and its educational opportunities. I really want to thank you again for this opportunity and look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you, Jamin. Also this evening, I'm pleased to introduce Tracy Cormany, who is being recommended as principal at Pine Creek High School. Tracy is joined this evening by her husband, Travis, son, Kale, 18, Carson, 15, and parents, Neil and Sharon Starkey. Tracy holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in English and a Bachelor of Science degree in secondary education from the University of Colorado Boulder and a Master of Arts degree in Education and Administration from the University of Phoenix. Tracy began her educational career at Palmer High School in Colorado Springs, School District 11, teaching English literature while serving as a yearbook advisor and coaching volleyball, basketball, and soccer. She eventually became the Palmer High School Athletics Director, Assistant Principal Business Manager, and served in that role for five years. After leaving Colorado Springs District 11, Tracy served for five years as Assistant Principal and Athletic Director at a wonderful school district named Cheyenne Mountain. Oh, I'm sorry, Tracy. While at Cheyenne Mountain, Tracy was named the 5A Athletic Director of the Year in 2004. Tracy then served as Assistant Principal of Curriculum and Instruction and Athletic Director at Sand Creek High School in Falcon School District 49, as well as Chairman of the Chassa Volleyball Committee before arriving in Academy District 20. Since 2012, Tracy has served as Assistant Principal at Rampart High School. We're pleased to present Tracy to you tonight for the position of principal at Pine Creek High School. And Tracy, would, would you like to share a few words? Good evening. Thank you for allowing me some time to speak at this evening's Board of Education meeting. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be the principal at Pine Creek High School and would like to thank the members of the interview teams, the leadership in District 20, Dr. David Peake, Dr. Susan Field, Dr. Jim Smith, Mr. Tom Gregory and the Board of Education for your time, your guidance and your support throughout this process. I appreciate your confidence in me and I am ready to get to work. I would also like to thank my family for their unconditional support throughout my 28 year career as an educator, coach and administrator. Joining me this evening, as already stated by Dr. Peake, is my husband, Travis, and my children, Kale and Carson. In addition, my parents, Neil and Sharon Starkey, are also present as we celebrate the beginning of this new chapter in my educational career. I'm appreciative of the village that surrounds me and that has supported me throughout this journey. My nine years at Rampart High School has been awesome, and I am thankful for the teachers, faculty, students, and administration that made my time at Rampart so special. You will always have a special place in my heart, and I'm a better person for knowing all of you. Finally, I look forward to joining and being a part of the Pine Creek Eagle family. I would like to thank everyone from the Pine Creek community that has already reached out to me with words of support and congratulations. I'm excited for this new chapter and look forward to this leadership opportunity. I promise to embody all of the Creek cornerstones of character that defines Pine Creek High School. Go Eagles. Thank you, Tracy. And finally, I'm pleased tonight to introduce Debbie Holt, who is being recommended as the principal at Challenger Middle School. Debbie is uh, joined in spirit with uh, her son, Tom, who is in Monument, and daughter, Tiffany, out in Portland, Oregon. Debbie holds a Bachelor in Science and Mathematics Education, which was obtained from the University of Central Florida in Orlando, Florida, and a Master of Arts degree in Education Administration and Supervision from the University of Phoenix. Debbie began her educational career in 1989, teaching computers and mathematics in Kissimmee, Florida. Upon moving to Colorado, she taught mathematics and science in Fountain Fort Carson School District 8 before serving as assistant principal at Carson Middle School on the Fort Carson base for three years. Debbie then transitioned as a coordinator of instructional technology, CTE, and AVID director at Harrison School District 2 for four years before holding the position of Federal Programs Coordinator in Falcon School District 49, where she also served as a secondary specialist. Upon moving, uh, I'm sorry, and for since 2010, Debbie has served, as you know, as Assistant Principal at Timberview Middle School. Debbie, is there anything you'd like to share?
Thank you, Mr. Gregory, Ms. Reynolds, and the board. Thank you so much. I am humbled and honored to be chosen as the next principal of Challenger Middle School. The leadership in District 20 has been a wonderful resource for me on this particular journey. I want to thank everyone that took the time out of their day to prepare me for this new challenge. And even though it's difficult to leave my Timberview family after 11 years, I'm super excited to be joining the Challenger family. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie, and thank you, Mr. Gregory, and Ms. Reynolds. No further comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peak. <clears throat> I do have a few uh, additional announcements. Foothills Elementary students have been busy creating festive thank you notes on brown paper bags. You may ask yourself why. Healthcare workers use brown paper bags to store their N95 masks between patients. So when a Foothills student who happens to have two parents who work in healthcare shared this information with classmates, the entire school decided to turn boring brown paper bags into happy and festive mask holders. We will be posting a story and a video about this cool project on our website and Facebook page tomorrow. You'll need to check it out. <clears throat> Excuse me. A junior at Pine Creek High School is being, named, is being recognized for her outstanding photography. Maddie Hemsley was among 240 high school students who submitted photography to the Colorado Photographic Arts Center annual competition. She was then only one of 30 students chosen to have her photograph which fe features a playground swing covered in caution tape on the organization's online gallery through the end of March. Congratulations. Dashita Sharma, a junior at Discovery Canyon Campus High School, is being recognized by UCCS for her innovative work helping a professor with cerebral palsy better communicate. Dashita helps, helped develop an eyelash extension that allows this professor to say yes or no with a single, simple blink of an eye. The idea and technology have been a life-challenging communication tool for this professor. Congratulations to Shriya Krishnan, a DCC high school junior, for earning a spot on the DECA State Officers Board. She's the first DCC student selected for a state officer position. Congratulations to both of them. This past Saturday, eight Liberty High School students swept the floor at the National History Day Regionals at Colorado College. This year's topic was communication in history, the key to understanding. These Lancers excelled in every category and their individual projects are all advancing to the state competition in May. And lastly, congratulations to Woodman Roberts Elementary School parent, Dr. Anna Olson for earning the Community Service Award from the Zebulon Pike chapter of the National Society of Daughters of the American Revolution. Dr. Olson donated snacks, lots of coffee, and extra masks for teachers and students. She has two children who attend the school and wanted to make sure staff felt appreciated during this unprecedented year. And I would add, interestingly enough, Dr. Olson was the first person who, in our community who communicated with me last, either late February or early March, uh, about COVID. And, and the pandemic and the uh, cautions and uh, what was coming. And at that time, it's kind of difficult to remember back then, but in late February uh, and even in early March in Colorado, it really hadn't become a thing yet. Uh, but she was the first one that had uh, reached out and, and uh, talked to me about the possibilities of what was coming and um, uh, we've stayed in communication ever since, and I would say, uh, I know Miss Allen is speaking later this evening. We could get uh, numbers from Miss Allen, but not only did Dr. Olson donate and, and partners donate masks to Wooden Roberts, um, uh, but thousands and thousands, uh, she arranged thousands and thousands of N95 masks to be donated to District 20. Uh, the District 20 School District also. So uh, thank you to her. She's very passionate uh, about her profession and our district uh, both. So uh, thank you, Ms. Reynolds. That's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Gregory. We need a motion to approve the following resolutions. 194.21, approval of matters relating to administrative staff license. 195.21, approval of matters relating to licensed staff teachers. 196.21, approval of matters relating to licensed staff licensed support and special services provider. 
19721 through 20221 approval of resolutions for non renewal of contract of probationary teachers 2002 excuse me 2321 approval of matters relating to classified staff and approval of the board of education regular meeting minutes from february 18th 2021 so moved second roll call please mrs cloninger aye mr lavalley aye mr lundberg aye mrs reynolds aye mr tembe aye well congratulations to um Jamin, Tracy, and Debbie. I hear the applause out in the atrium and where we would normally take a break, we can't tonight because of COVID, but know that we so appreciate you three and look forward to working with you. And we're so glad you have an audience out there with a celebration of sorts. Um, better than last year. Last year we were in virtually ha having this announcement, so we're moving there slowly. Again, congratulations to all of you. Moving on to agenda item number 11. Um, there were no items pulled from the consent agenda, so I'm going to move to item 13C, which we moved earlier in this meeting, and that is the naming of Building B at Air Academy High School. Mr. Gregory. Yes, I would invite Dr. Smith and Mr. Olson to the podium, please. Dr. Smith, please introduce because I've left out some others. I will come on in, please. I'll ask Mr. Olson to give the full rundown, if you don't mind. Thanks for being here. So good evening. And pursuant to policy and procedure, FF and FFR, naming of buildings and facilities, uh, Mr. Dan Olson, principal of Air Academy, formed a committee to discuss possible names for the newly renovated Building B. So at this time, I'd like Dan to share that uh, process with you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for letting us take the time to um, to speak with you tonight about something that is very near and dear to all of our hearts and to countless uh, people that have gone through Air Academy High School. Um, I'm joined tonight by three amazing teachers. Miss Amy Cofield is our co-department chair for mathematics. Um, we have Miss Austina Lee, who is our choir director, and we have Miss Susan Mance, who is our theater director as well as our department chair for our performing arts and they're going to speak tonight as well at air academy high school uh, we have a tradition to name parts of the building after they have been built or renovated um, i'm sure mr lundberg can can attest to that as as an old cadet but in 98 the last time we had significant renovations our gymnasium was renamed the the mike lynch gymnasium after a long time um, coach and, and athletic director. And our auditorium was named the Dave Filsinger Hall after our, our amazing uh, performing arts teacher. And so when we were blessed by the Board of Education and the taxpayers in Academy 20 to renovate Building B, immediately people started to talk about uh, what are we going to, what are we going to name this? And one name um, rose to the top. Everybody that I spoke to said we need to name Building B after Mr. Glenn Hoyt. Um, I had countless people say that very same thing. This was three years ago, and I, I went to um, to um, Dr. Hatchell at the time, and, and I, I floated the idea to him, and he said, well, because Mr. Hoyt is still an employee in the district, he, he doesn't qualify. So we, we shelved it. And uh, Mr. Hoyt retired this past year. And so once again, um, this, this idea came up and I, I approached um, Superintendent Gregory and Dr. Smith, and they told me I'd put the committee together and kind of go through this formal process and then propose this to you all who would then make the, the determination. And so that's what we have done. Um, we have met and, and once again, we have, we have discussed different ideas, but once again, that same name came to the surface and I cannot personally think of a better educator and a better representative of what Air Academy stands for than Mr. Hoyt. And I'm going to have my esteemed colleagues give some specifics as they all have a very unique take on what sets this educator apart and what um, he has meant to not just the Air Academy community, but to the greater community of Academy 20 in Colorado Springs. 
So Ms. Cofield, would you like to say a few words? Good evening. Thank you for your time this evening. I do have a unique perspective on Glen Hoyt. We shared a classroom for six years and I got to observe him teaching AP Calculus BC, which is an everyday class. So I basically got to watch him teach every day for six years. Pretty cool, I know. Glenn exemplifies what it means to be a cadet, and he deserves this honor for two main reasons. The first is his teaching legacy, and the second is his mentorship legacy. His teaching legacy, he has touched the lives of thousands of students at Air Academy over his 38 year career. He also used calculus as a vehicle to teach students about life. For example, each person is on a current trajectory in their life, and they are also the sum of all of the experiences that have brought them to this point in life, which is the two, which are the two main foundational concepts of calculus. He also taught students that they're more than just a grade. For example, after every single test in calculus, he had students raise their right hand and repeat that they understand their worth as a person is not defined by the grade on that calculus test. Finally, his teaching legacy was that Glenn Hoyt had one rule for his classroom, to be kind. That was his singular rule. His mentorship legacy, um, Glenn was on the committee that hired me at Air Academy 20 plus years ago. His first year of teaching calculus was my first year at Air Academy High School. Um, his first year of official retirement when he came back and taught part time was the first year I started teaching calculus. And I am now currently a co-department chairperson, which is what Glenn served as for many, many years. So I now follow in his footsteps and proudly so. Glenn not only taught students, but he also taught teachers how to have a fulfilling career. He welcomed our new teachers to Air Academy at last year's staff meeting and explained how very special Air Academy is because of our teachers. He is a quiet leader who led by example and strength of character, and he embodies the idea that teaching is an infinitely improvable art form. Glenn continued to learn new ways to teach throughout his entire career. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Austina Lee. I first met Glenn Hoyt in 1997 because he's the father of a classmate of mine. We went through Woodman Roberts to Eagle View and through Air Academy and graduated together. And somehow he has looked exactly the same since 1997. I think he has the same glasses. Uh, but he was my calculus teacher in BC Calc. My junior year of high school at Air Academy and I was one of the students that got to raise my hand and assert that calculus and my grade in calculus did not define me as a person. <laughs> and I can remember so vividly the classroom in B building that he was in for over 30 years until Dan went and gutted it. <laughs> I can remember where I sat. I remember the sun rising and turning Blodgett Peak pink. I don't know if you've gotten to experience that phenomenon, but I know I am one of countless people that when they think of Glenn Hoyt, they move back to that spot in his room. My classmates, we all know where we sat in his class, and that's not true um, of every, every experience. And then, Miss Cofield and Mr. Hoyt nine years ago sat on a board and hired me to teach math at Air Academy and he served as my department chair with kindness and generosity. I had so little experience and he came alongside me and coached and guided me with extreme patience. As a high schooler, he had been the FCA leader and at six o'clock he would show up on Thursday mornings and coach with kindness and there is not any hesitation for me as a professional then to step in and trust him. And I want to share that we have collected with Dave Felsinger. He coached with Coach Lynch and he also worked in the theater department 
with Dave Filsinger, and we have been collecting um, notes as we have put together a song that Dave Filsinger wrote. We hoped to do it for his retirement, but of course we couldn't do that. And the emails that I have received from people from 1982, Coach Hoyt, this is what he meant to me. Right now we have a student in our production who will be serving or spending time this summer at the Stanford Space Program, which is Mr. Hoyt's alma mater, whose father threw discus for Coach Hoyt when he was a track coach. He coached track and football and spent uh, his spent countless hours in the theater department. Uh, but one of my most prominent memories of Mr. Hoyt as a professional was in a meeting where Tori and McGill asked us to define what does it mean to be a cadet. And as Mrs. Cofield mentioned, Glenn's description of why our cadet culture is so unique was because our teachers care. Our teachers care for our students. He watched that with his kids and he epitomizes, I apologize for repeating everything Amy says, but he epitomizes the kindness and the compassion at all levels and models this for us. And I cannot think of a better person to name this building after because three decades, we all go there in our minds and he deserves it. Thank you. Good evening. To briefly sum up, I think you get the idea. He's an extraordinary man and we are a family at Air Academy. We are, we are DNA. We are intermingled with caring for and with each other. No one models that better than Glenn Hoyt. And if you think about the people you know in education, who has stayed in the same building for this amount of time. No one does that. But he cared enough about Air Academy to invest his life, his energy, his kindness, his wisdom. And he is in every corner of every building on our campus. And if you've been to our campus, you know that that is a complicated thing to do. And he led with integrity and honor and enthusiasm and love, and you can hear it in our voice, the affection and respect that we have for this man cannot be matched. So thank you for listening and we appreciate your time. Thank you all. And we could have had a hundred people lined up to give those same testimonies about Glenn. And I, I want to close with this. Glenn was diagnosed 18 months ago with stage four pancreatic cancer. That is not the reason we are here today. We are here today because of his legacy and what he has meant to our community. We are here today because what he has done for countless students in this community. We are here today to ask that building B is renamed Glen Hoyt Hall so that people a year from now, 10 years from now, 100 years from now, know what this man was about and the influence and the impact he has had for countless, countless people at Air Academy High. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your consideration. And thank you for everything you do for our students in Academy 20. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Olson and team. Comments or questions for the team before they leave us. Well, it was wise of you to put the drama teacher last. Just kidding. Um, I saw the passion. Um, you know, Mr. Hoyt is an amazing person. I so appreciated working with him. And you're right. He was just always the same, steadfast, um, consistent, and still is, I'm, I'm sure. Um, what an incredible man. So I appreciate all that you said about him this evening. I'm not seeing anybody else having questions or comments, but um, it sounds like you've been, I, I feel the passion, I feel the emotion, and I feel the excitement you have for that. So thank you for your for your presentation to us this evening. Nice job. Mr. Gregory, would you like to say something? It sounds, looks like. Sure. Um, I, I guess 
just watching the I don't think it's uh, uh, I'll say accident that there was a math teacher, a choir teacher and a drama teacher uh, because what I know about Glenn is uh, your comment about every corner of the building. Uh, I was a math teacher at Rampart when he was and I always used to hear about this name uh, and I finally got to meet him, but it wasn't in a math classroom. He was involved with theater. He was involved with choir. He was involved uh, graduations. He he was involved in every aspect of the school, which I think is really impressive. So the word I would use is Renaissance man uh, to describe to describe him because he was involved in in every aspect of the school, and I think even supporting probably some of the administrative function over the years. So uh, that's all I have. But I I think they did a wonderful job summing it up. I do too, and I would just like to add that I have no doubt that when we get to, uh, I thought Mr. Lundberg might have something to say, so I'll give you a second. But when you get to a place where you um, can actually have a celebration and honor that, I bet every member of this board would love to be there and um, honor you and him as well, that process. Mr. Lundberg. I was lucky enough to be there when he was hired and they don't get any better. It was as fine as they get. And, and you were right on the administrative functions. He even used to go and he would organize the schedules for the teachers for the administration because it got too complicated when they put it on the board. He would come up and he'd organize it for them. Unbelievable person. Talent, kindness. He embodies everything that you want to be as a teacher. That's a great closing comment from an ex cadet himself. So thank you all for being here tonight. OK. Let's move on to agenda item 12A, EL 2.7, Employment, Compensation and Benefits. Mr. Gregory. Yes, Dr. Peak, please. Welcome back. Mr. Sacolini, we have several mics up here. I don't know if they're OK to be kept kept on. OK, great. Thank you. Well, good evening. I, hold good on. E oh, sorry. I just have a message that I'm seeing no audio. Is that still true in my chat? Now it sounds like maybe we hear it. OK, it's coming and going, but I want to make sure your words of wisdom aren't lost. So it says <laughs> sounds good now. So you're up, Dr. Peek. You can pick any mic. All right. Appreciate being back in front of in front of in front of all you this evening. All right. Uh, Ms. Allen and I are pleased to present the monitoring report for Executive Limitation 2.7 Employment, Compensation and Benefits. This report presents information regarding the superintendent's compliance related to not allowing the district compensation plans to deter attracting and retaining the highest quality staff, not ignoring the opinion of affected parties when determining benefit plans, not developing compensation and benefit plans that deviate materially from the geographic or professional market, not promising or implying guaranteed employment, and not changing his own compensation and benefits. Supportive data is reported related to the interpretation of the policy provisions. And this policy was last monitored in March 2020. In comparing compliance data for this year's report to last year's report, there are some observations I'd like to share with the Board of Education. Despite the fiscal volatility we faced with the onset of COVID-19 pandemic last spring, it is with appreciation that I can report that the board still approved a one-time payment of 1.25%, approximately 2 million non-reoccurring to all staff member base salaries in the month of September 2020, and covered the 15% premium increases, approximately a half a million reoccurring after removal of cafeteria benefit, which was a savings of 1.5 to the voluntary medical benefits without passing along those increases to our staff members. This additional compensation and benefits increases for the 2021 school year, even in the midst of an economic uncertainty equated to approximately 2.5 million. It should also be noted, the district spent approximately 2 million toward additional professional learning to better equip teachers to navigate remote and synchronous learning environments for students 
offered additional leave of absence options up to one year for staff who were not comfortable teaching during COVID pandemic and availed online teaching assignments to others who wanted to teach but not in person. In regards to interpretation of EL 2.7.1, fewer than 5% of teachers offered contracts decide not to follow through because of salary. Now that our recruiting process has changed via Workday, we have data that allows us to better identify candidates who may decline an offer of employment even before a contract is presented. In addition, we recognize the current interpretation does not accurately represent typical employment offer acceptance rates, OAR, within industry, which most often reflect a 90% acceptance rate, not a 95% acceptance rate. As referenced from various sources, including Society for Human Resources Management, SHRM at 89%, the National Association of Colleges and Employers, 67.5%, and Recruiting.com 89% as examples. As such, we intend to adjust the interpretation to fewer than 10% for declined employment offers due to salary or wages, consider total compensation benefits package language in the future, and fewer than 10% exiting the district due to salary or wages. In total, 723 staff members, which represents all employee types, uh, left the district in the past year of those who decided to leave the district and choose to complete the exit survey, 13 of 54 or 24%, uh, or if it's 13 out of 723, it's 1.8%, responded that salary was all or part of the reason for their separation from employment with the district. For the Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, the Colorado Department of Education requires districts to report in-field status and encourages districts to prioritize the hiring of appropriately licensed teachers who have demonstrated subject matter competency in their teaching subject area. Accordingly, our position has been to continue to require in-field status for all content area positions. However, we have had to consider on a case-by-case -case basis, adjusting this expectation for a few identified hard-to-fill areas, such as world language, STEM, TAG, teacher librarian. All special Education teachers are still required via ESSA and the Exceptional Children's Education Act, ECEA, to obtain a valid Colorado license, including licensure obtained through alternative routes with a special education endorsement and hold a bachelor's degree. For CDE, the requirements to earn a special education endorsement include degree in special education, passing state special education test, and passing elementary education test. In District 20, special education educators must have successfully completed these requirements or be enrolled in a special education alternative license program to secure a temporary educator eligibility. In reference to EL 2.7.2, the district will experience a total increase in medical insurance premiums at 7.5% due to utilization rates that continue to exceed targeted expectations of 86%. Currently, District 20's loss ratio is at approximately 89%. However, it should be noted that the overall utilization rates as such are trending down, and therefore we are only facing a 7.5% increase, which equates to approximately 1.1 million as compared with last year's 15% increase. This year, the district's insurance broker Gallagher conducted a review during the fall of 2020 to gather information about possible self-insured options for the district in the future to decrease premium costs. It was not recommended to pursue at this time, could be considered, however, into the future. As indicated within the report data for EL 2.7.3, we have once again included additional survey information related to teacher salary. We included comparative data across the state and most importantly, our own backyard, 13 neighboring school districts. When compared with our neighboring school districts, based on survey data, our starting teacher salary was second only to Fountain Fort Carson. District 20 starting salary at 41,000. District 8 starting salary at 44,000. However, Manitou Springs is not in this comparative data and they too actually surpass District 20 starting salary at 43,000 and some change. We continue to remain in the top quartile for the maximum salaries and wages for teacher and principal assistant principals in all but four classified positions in four central office administrations based on salary studies from Ohm Consulting Services, 
School Board Support Services, our consultant from Gillette, Wyoming, and our Human Resources Department review of local school districts in the region. It's important to note that maximum salaries and wages have become more difficult to review as regional districts have been moving away from traditional matrices similar to District 20 after the recommendations from the Teacher and Classified Experience Step Review Committees from 2013-14 and 2014-15 school years. In an effort to further capture relativity to maximum salaries, not deviating materially as compared with other districts, we added the terms internal outliers and external outliers. Internal outliers means that a maximum teacher salary or classified staff wage exceeds two and a half times and a maximum principal or assistant principal or central office administrator exceeds beyond one and a half times. External outliers means that the maximum salary or wage exceeds beyond the third quartile by a value greater than one and a half times the interquartile range. Note the maximum D20 teacher salary is an internal outlier based on two and a half times the minimum teacher salary referenced in GCBA 1R. However, no teacher makes that actual value. The highest current D20 teacher salary would still be in the top quartile, top quartile, but would not be defined as an outlier. As noted with the statement of compliance and non-compliance for EL 2.7.3, based on published salary information for the 2019-20 school year, the school district was unable to prioritize and commit the necessary increases to meet the top quartile for classified staff, teachers, assistant principals, principals, central office in the 2021 school year due to COVID-19 pandemic. This is an example that each upcoming year presents challenges because we cannot be certain what resources other school districts will be committing to salaries and wages. In addition, you will note 15 of 46 classified positions are below top quartile after review of the 2021 salary study. We do, uh, we do deviate from the top quartile for minimum salary for one of seven principal assistant principal positions, and that is the elementary assistant principal position. Additionally, we deviate from being the top quartile related to the minimum salaries in three of five central administrative positions. It should be noted that the district is currently engaged uh, also in a pay equity audit with the assistance of Littler Mendelssohn PC to assess and remedy any salary and wage discrepancies that may not meet the new requirements of the Equal Pay for Equal Work Act in Colorado. The main components of this act include prohibiting employers from discriminating on the basis of sex or sex in combination with another protected status by paying employees of different sexes differently for substantially similar work, regardless of job title, prohibiting employers from seeking salary history from job applicants, requiring employers to post internal job openings and listing salary ranges on all postings. So currently we are not in compliance with EL 2.7.3. I would like to share with you some anecdotal information regarding our teachers. This year, our total number of licensed non-administrative staff is 1,645. The average salary not including benefits is $52,754.92. The average number of years a teacher has worked in District 20 is eight. That was the same last year. The average number of years a teacher has worked in his or her teaching career is 10.8. And for teachers, the average level of education attained is a master's degree. And we do have 27 teachers who with a doctoral degree. You may also be interested in knowing that the average teacher salary within Colorado, according to the Colorado Department of Education for 2019-20 was $57,746. And the average teacher salary in the United States was $61,730, according to the National Center for Educational Statistics last reported in 2018-19, which represents again the latest published data. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have and we'd be pleased to hear your discussion. Yeah, before I turn that over to anyone else, I just have a question back on two point um shoot. On two point seven point you've talked about changing the interpretation, I believe, in two point seven point one, fewer than five percent, and you said you were going to change that interpretation to ten percent. Did you give us rationale and I missed it? I did. Sorry, Ms. Reynolds. Yes. What, uh, yeah. What's uh, the reason? Yes. Industry standard uh, offer acceptance. Offer acceptance rates, OAR, is an industry standard for acceptance rates within employers uh, in varied industries. And after reviewing multiple um, 
environments or multiple agencies, uh, they come back routinely uh, less than or at 90%, not at 95%. In terms of the number of individuals who accept as an industry standard of performance for an employer hiring and, and having folks accept the position and stay. So the interpretation would read simply fewer than 10% of teachers offered contracts decide not to follow up and fewer than 10% of staff members decide to leave because of, okay. Correct. All right, thank you. It, it, was there any other conversation about changing interpretation any place else in this EL 2.7? Uh, no, okay. but definition of terms, we added the uh, e internal and external outliers, and that was in part response to the request from last year's MRE. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Thank you. I'm sorry, I guess I must have just tuned right into changing interpretation, and I went, what? Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you for that. Uh, other comments or questions for Dr. Peek? Mr. Lavalle. Thank you, Dr. Peek. Um, first, I want to I want to thank you. Um, that was sort of my, I'll call it a gripe that that um, 2.7.3 uh, would not deviate um, materially from you know high or low. Thank you for addressing the the high part. Um, I, I we all suspected that was the case that we weren't deviating high, and and now we know. And I think that better helps us um, to in fact make sure that the limitation is is applicable um, is is being enforced. So thank you for that. Um, and answer my question about the 5% interpretation. I, I'm just curious, are all of our CTE teachers, I, they must all be certified based on what what I read that we are also, I was a little su pleasantly, su I was surprised because I know CTE would be an area where we would struggle with certified teachers. Um, but yes. apparently we're, we're not struggling in that. Well, um, I'm not, I'm not sure how you'd want to define yeah. struggling. I would say that we continue to be challenged by hiring. Uh, we continue to be challenged by hiring all licensed staff professionally, and CTE continues to also be a challenged area. So yes, uh, if we are uh, hiring folks to serve in those capacities, we absolutely are making sure that they meet the requirements with uh, an alignment and consistent with CDE. Yeah. Uh, I'm. This may sound like blasphemy. I'm, I'm more concerned that they know how to do the job, especially in CT, but that, that that's okay. Uh, the fact that they're all certified that. that well, and can I just add, price. there's federal funds that go with the certification for CT teachers. Correct. So, Correct. right, Correct. still? It, so that's it, why yes. we continue to push that. And, and there's also another component to it that adds a little bit more to some of the TT, CTE, and that is, uh, and Dr. Peek would have to answer any detailed questions. Um, but for dual credit, if, if students are going to earn right. college credit and high school credit, yes. it's not just yep. the CDE, I'll call it minimum. Uh, it's also meeting the Colorado Commission uh -huh. higher education yep. requirements, uh, which is another yes. level of certification. So to your question, you know, somebody certified to teach auto mechanics, auto mechanics um, the answer may be maybe. Yes, they're certified to teach at a high school level, we'll say, but it's another level to have them certified so that students in that class also can get okay. uh, community college or college level credit for it. That's correct. Good, good for our district um, yes. that we attract those people. And that's a, I think that's a, a, a credit to us. I, I, and if I may, I think in part with the passage of the bond and that we're expanding program, I think is just incredible in places like Liberty High School and other high schools that are growing program. It's yeah. a great appeal. That's and an awesome place. If you've gone over to that CTE oh, yeah. and seen the the teachers, I think I stood in the <laughs> medical room for about an hour grilling the teachers there that were coming from Pikes Peak, I believe, and they were phenomenal. Yeah. So just yeah, a great awesome. program. Yeah. Um, so regarding 2.7.3, we did not, and on all of them, we. Not all of them did we hit the top quartile, but were we in the top half, top top sixty percent? Were we close? You yeah, know, I mean, we, just just generally, I mean, yeah. did we miss any by a like by a long shot, or were we close and just didn't quite hit that top? Well, quartile? it varied by position type, and yeah. it was a bit of a moving target. Understand? Yeah, and uh, for some classified positions, we were only a few pennies away, hmm. and then for others, uh, uh, which still kept us in that top. Definitely top 50, even top 60 percent. 
uh, but for some positions we were off being in the top quartile and even below the median for some of those positions. Part part of uh, our challenge, of course, is um, bringing that back up, and I'm 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 confident I think that we're going to be able to do that to to address both any classified positions and as I mentioned the elementary assistant principal category. And, and in fact, we had the, during the working session we discussed in the budget yes. being able to do just that. Yes. And and I I think that that the public should know that yes we we did not reach that. However, comma we are may take you all we are taking act, active steps to rectify that. So that, that would be correct. Yep. Um, so uh, I talked about that already. Um, yeah, I was I was a little surprised that that other school districts beat us um, <laughs> in pay. Sure. Fountain Fort Carson doesn't surprise me because all the military money they get, right? They sure. it seems like every year they they do uh, good on them. I mean, they they do. They have a lot of military kids there. What other districts do, do you know? I mean, I was a little surprised because we're all kind of in the same boat. And yes, we didn't have those funds to to boost last year, but but nor did anybody else. I was a little surprised to see that. Do you have any thoughts on that? I, I don't, and I may defer to, to Mr. Gregory. I would just say in general, most districts did not deviate or adjust much in the way of their base compensations for schedules. If there was any adjustments, it was uh, most likely in the, uh, if it was anywhere, may have been in the Denver area. When we compare ourselves across the full state, so when we work with the consultant from Wyoming and he looks across the entire state. We find ourselves in the top quartile, but we're about 23, 24 from 23rd or 24th, but that's out of 178 school districts. Okay. So and most of those school districts that would be above us are typically in the Denver, greater Denver metro area. OK. Yeah. Um, I think that answered it. So again, I I wish these numbers were better, but I I'm personally not overly concerned by that. I, I see us making changes. I, I'm just I'm pontificating a little bit, but I just want to say that publicly. So thank you, Dr. Peak. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lavelle. Mr. Tempe. So Dr. Peak, I think you may have just addressed it, but so I look at the Colorado average and I think you said 57,776. Yes. Um, and for our 1,620 teachers, roughly 52,755. So that's about a 9.5% difference. Um, would you say uh, majority of that, and again, data can lie, um, but sure. is this the weighting of these uh, more Denver area school districts driving that number up because there's certainly districts well below us from a compensation standpoint. Uh, the other thing you could infer from this is potentially there is a great deal of seniority in some of the positions that are higher compensated in districts around Denver too. So the data can lie a little bit too. Well, uh I, I guess I would just respond. Yes, there could be contributing factors and impacts. Two of which you cited could be plausible. The other to recognize too, when we do the comparative data, is that um, teacher contract years from one district to another can vary slightly as well. So we have a 183-day yep. contract for our teachers, but other districts may be 182 or 188. So there can be a little bit of variability mm -hmm. that goes yeah. into that as well. Yeah. So, thank you. Mr. Lumberg. One thing I want to add, and it's is just supplemental, and it's just a reminder, particularly for the public, that uh, we did this good being floor funded. There is one school district, it's a couple dollars less than us, I think, but nobody else. And this is what we've done. So that that's pretty good. So my hat's off. To you, Mr. Gregory and Ms. Allen and the, and the staff, it's well done. If I, if I could, I was going to comment on that, Ms. Reynolds, if, if I may, that I don't want to be a whiner, um, but the what Dr. Peek just presented was outputs, right? Uh, average salaries, and, and there are, we can argue whether the average is the right one to use or daily rate is a better one or whatever it is, but those are all outputs. Uh, on the input side, uh, there's never, we, we never 
create relativity between the outputs uh, and the inputs. Uh, Mr. Mr. Lundberg, I'm glad just mentioned one of those inputs, which is uh, what is the PPR level, uh, because it varies. Uh, you know, we're the lowest one in the states, uh, and the highest is about twice as much. We're about eight thousand, roughly eight thousand. The highest is about sixteen thousand per student. So that's that's a very different uh, input. The other one that exists uh, around the state is. Um, uh, which is another input is. Uh, it's, it almost feels like a leapfrog game, if you will. Uh, several years ago, District 11 passed a mill levy override, a uh, very, very large one. Uh, a few years ago, Cheyenne Mountain passed a mill levy override. Uh, we, we were beneficiaries of that in 2008. There are some districts uh, in Denver that kind of consistently ride the statutory maximum uh, for override revenue, where if they, as long as they have room to and their voters will support it. They they hit the, the top. There's a maximum in Colorado. So anyways, my, my point is Mr. Lundberg makes a good uh, a good observation. That is there are inputs into this also that we really don't have control over. We try to do the best we can with outputs, uh, but we're restricted on the input side. So I, I just appreciate you mentioning that because it is it is definitely is a factor. So I don't see any other comments. I just wanted to add one, and that is while I appreciate that and I understand it from the financial perspective, I also appreciate that there was not a request to change the interpretation of the terms in 2.7.3 and that the upper quartile remains important to us, mm -hmm. right? I think that's what's important in our district. It always has been. I know that boards before us have been pretty adamant about that. And it's a difficult thing. It's a game. I know we play all the time. I remember when Dr. Hatchell used to, it was who could stay quiet the longest about anything that we were doing for teacher salaries right. so that we weren't showing our hand because we want anyone to get ahead of us. So it is a game we play. We want to be on top of it. We want to treat our staff well. And so I do appreciate that. And I understand the whole COVID piece of this. Um, I did go back to the last two years of these reports and they were in compliance mm -hmm. at um, for the last two years at least, and then I stopped looking. I imagine it was probably true even further back. So what we've often done, and, and Mr. Gregory, you'll probably remember this as well or better than I, is that um, we address it through an initiative. Um, I don't know if that's what your intention is, but I, I guess I'm just looking forward to what's the plan, to, to remedy it this year or to remedy it going forward. I know we talked about it, as you said, Mr. Lavalli, in our work session. Um, but what's it going to take? And I'm not really talking about a dollar amount. What's the reality of how is this easily in compliance next year or okay. I think yes it is and I think even the dollar amount is um, such that we would be able to remedy that even going into next year. So that might not even need to be an initiative at that point because it doesn't take right. that much of an effort for us. The only the only caution I don't know I should say the only there may be other cautions but um, as Dr. Peek has referenced for many years, it's it's kind of a arrears sure. game, you know. Where when we established um, uh, when the board established wages for last year, it was based on this comparative data from other school districts. Yeah. Essentially, that that current year. So it's we don't know what other school districts will or can do for next year. So we're we're going to catch up based on the data Dr. Peak presented. But that's this year's data. We're not trying to project. We, you know, for hourly wages, for example, you know, if the target is, I'm going to make up a number uh, for any position is, let's say it's $17.50 is where we need to get to be in the top quartile. <clears throat> we may go to $17.75 or $18 and try to get a little bit ahead of it. But it's, it feels like we're always playing catch up and it's a it's a bit of a moving target sure. but absolutely. absolutely I would agree with Dr. Peak and regardless of it would have to get really really bad on the revenue side this year to uh, uh, not make this happen for next year and I do know that it's important to Dr. Peak and to you Mr. Gregory I just yeah one of the community also here it's important to all of us um, we, we, we want to be there so other comments or questions okay 
I'm uh, thank you, Dr. Peek, for that. And sorry, my computer's about to restart, and I want to make sure that doesn't happen. Okay. Um, so um, thank you for your for your report tonight and for the additional information that you provided. So thank, thank you. you. So I'm going to move to our MRE for this, and that the first one is, and this was this one's going to be important given what we heard tonight. Um, and the first one is the superintendent's interpretation of the policy reasonable. And remember, we're going from this year to, or from last year to this year. So your answer is yes. And remember, that was at that 5%, but remember that is the superintendent's interpretation. We don't make a judgment about that 10% until the next round of monitoring. So, okay, just wanted to make sure you're all nodding and you guys get it. Okay, good, thank you. So that's a yes. Is there sufficient evidence to determine compliance for each section? And I'm seeing nods. Are all sections in compliance? No. And the the section that is not is 2.7.3. And we could specify reasons, but Ms. Dodge, you could just take that right off that report if you would. Uh, recognition of exemplary performance. Data. I heard you say that you appreciated the data. And I also heard you say you appreciated the effort and the understanding around the finances. But OK, Rec uh, concerns regarding performance. Um, would you like to see additional different evidence or formatting changes in the most monitor in the next monitoring report cycle? First time in three years, no? Oh. Oh, you'd like to see that be uh, in, in compliance. Oh. Oh. Oh, gotcha. OK. Thank you for the interpretation there, Heather. Um, do you see evidence which is extraneous or no longer necessary? No. Are there any areas that would like you'd like to learn more about prior to the next presentation? And that's a no. Are there linkage needs the board should address? And that's a no. Do you see the need for any part of this policy to be changed? And that's a no also. Thank you, Dr. Peek. OK, I'm going to move on to agenda item number 13. That's accreditation handbook revisions for school year 2021-2022. Mr. Gregory. Dr. Smith, please. Good evening. <clears throat> so thank you for the opportunity to present this year's updates to the accreditation handbook. So part of the board charge to the District Accountability Committee states that the DAC shall form an accreditation subcommittee which will review the district accreditation process and make recommendations. The accreditation handbook, which is updated and posted on the district website each year, outlines the process and elements of Academy District 20's accreditation for schools. Our goal for the handbook is that it provides a comprehensive description of District 20's unique accreditation process and all related supporting information. This year's accreditation subcommittee, which is comprised of 16 volunteers from the DAC, reviewed the current accreditation handbook and made suggested revisions. Additionally, members of the assessment office also reviewed the handbook and provided feedback. And in February, the full DAC was given the opportunity to review and provide feedback. We review and update the accreditation handbook each year and present changes to the Board of Education so that everyone is aware of any changes. Some years we've had significant changes in process, timelines or language in the handbook, but this is not one of those years. And you'll note that we did not make any significant changes in the handbook. But when you look at it, hopefully you'll notice that we did change dates to reflect the 2021-2022 school year. And we also updated the site plan review cycle and the external review uh, cycle as well. And as a reminder, as you remember, we did suspend all external reviews and site plans for this year, but we will resume that hopefully as our plan for the 2021-22 school year. So with that, uh, do you have any questions? I just want to know why you looked at me when you said you will note that we didn't make any, many changes. To them. <laughs> I, I don't dream about it anymore, but yes, thank you. <laughs> um, You're familiar with just, the handbook. Just recently. Anybody have comments or questions for Yes, uh, Mr. Tempe. Just a question for Dr. Smith. Is the accreditation subcommittee a good committee? <laughs> I get this question a lot, um, and I would say absolutely it's a great subcommittee and potentially the best subcommittee. 
I miss Honiger. Well, I just want to <laughs> say, and I have nothing to say about that because it gets brought up so much. Um, <laughs> but I just appreciate the work that goes into this. This is something that even, you know, since Karen was on uh, in that role, um, I started um, working with the DAC and I just, I really appreciate the efforts that are made here and um, and so just good job. I appreciate that report. Thank you. I was looking at um, Appendix B. Nope, Appendix A, the actual CDE contract. Does that actually get signed every year now or is that just like? You know what, it, it does not. Yeah. Um, it's kind of a holdover, but I've left it in there just as a, I guess a placeholder to see that's what we used to do, yeah. sort of a contract. Well, you know, it's in interesting. The, in the I, yes, it was just a slow minute. And I went back to the CDE website to look at that contract. It is the same contract. It's, and so it's not old. I mean, it's still their contract, but I wonder why. Anyway, the, just an aside. Yeah. So it's got the yeah. right language in there. I just wonder if we actually really sign like it. No enforcement, really. Or well, maybe it's in their absolutes or something. Yeah. Or assurances. Sorry, they call them assurances. Right. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. Um, just a, just an aside. Um, I looked at that and I thought, oh, I don't think I've seen that for a while. Um, other comments or questions? Just, just one more question. Yes. So, Dr. Smith, um, you've done all this virtually with DAC this year, which is commendable. Uh, it's hard enough just getting people together and consensus and getting work done. And so uh, kudos to the entire DAC and you for your leadership there. Um, any chance of in person this year to kind of conclude the year or is just given the numbers of 60 to 80 people probably going to lead us into hopefully next school year for live meetings right unfortunately i think it will be next year until we'll be able to join back together in person um i miss them you know yeah. i miss having our meetings in person yeah, yeah we, st we still play music at the start of the meetings though well, shakira yeah. and stuff, yeah. shakira sometimes yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, no, but the, you get so much out of that audience in terms of just uh, facial expressions and flexion and voices and just it builds some camaraderie between schools and parents. And so it'll be nice to get back to normal. Mm -hmm. so. yeah, absolutely. It's a fantastic committee. Yeah. Are you getting pretty good attendance virtually? It's not bad. I would say 60. That's still, still really good. Yeah. 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 They obviously did some good work on this document, as did you. So. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Okay, um, agenda item 13B, assessment update, NWEA map growth and cadence read act data, Mr. Gregory. Yes, we have a team of folks. Uh, Ms. Lang is gonna uh, join us. Ms. Patterson is gonna join us. And Ms. Ruskin is gonna join us. And I would just set it up a little bit by saying, um, this is something that's different, uh, new, we'll say, uh, that you really haven't seen before um, and may lead into or probably will lead into some of the discussion we're going to have in May uh, about uh, data reporting for uh, our ends. Um, this may lead into some possibilities into the future um, that, that we're not completely reliant or solely reliant upon CMAS or some other kind of uh, state required or federally required data. This is, um, I guess, save the stuff that Ms. Ruskin will talk about um, that may be required uh, by the state. This is really elected by District 20. So I think Ms. Patterson has a handout so because your monitors aren't working. Yes. No, but some people's devices aren't working as much. You're good, Mr. Lavalley, Mr. Gregory. <laughs> Just so you know, Jolene, the. Thank you. Right. So we're just gonna. I'll. I'll help us. Right. But, but we, some some board members have it pulled up inside of board docs. That's why on, it's. Yeah, we have it on board docs. Oh, Will. I'm like, who's missing? For the in there. Okay. Okay. So, Jolene, just so you know what's going on, so you know how to present that everybody outside of this room can see what they're presenting, what 
the slideshow. Folks in the room uh, can't see it. So that's gotcha. so the when Mr. Sackleady says you still may have to say next slide, please, so they know when to advance the slide for people outside this room. Uh, but folks inside the room can also when you say next slide, please, we'll know to go on to the next slide. And those of you that have two slides on your paper handout are going to have to wait one in between. <laughs> are going to have to wait one in between. In between, Mark, are you clicking slides? Oh, in there they are. Okay, so I need to. I wanted to decide if I could do it visually or auditorily. I'll use my mouse. Am I not on? I'm green. He's got to turn it up. Are we good? All right. Good evening. Um, Jolyn Patterson, the Director of Assessment and partnering with me tonight is Andy Ruskin, our Director of Literacy. <laughs> so we are going to share some assessment updates with you this evening. Next slide, please. So um, this last year we have adopted and we're going to walk through some of these pieces specifically with our NWA map growth assessment system. But over the, um, the last year, we have partnered closely with NWA as they, as they provided professional learning. And one of the pieces we've talked a lot about is assessment literacy. And you can see on the slide that it says assessment literacy is the process of gathering evidence of student learning to inform educated related decisions. So we want our focus in assessment to really provide a deeper understanding of the assessment, how it's used, and then of course, at the end of the day, how we can improve student achievement and learning. Next slide, please. So two years ago, this is actually year three, we started a program evaluation for assessment. So that team worked very closely together and we did a lot of research and investigation into what a balanced assessment system looks like. And so as a group, we created a definition of what we thought the best definition for Academy District 20 would be, and that will be on the next slide. So I know the infographics a little hard to see on that previous. We're going to walk through pieces of that. So you're, you're going to get that information captured in the next few slides. So the definition that we decided on for our programming and our assessment program was a balanced assessment program is a network of fair, varied and reliable assessment tools assessment practices and assessment data systems that provide information for the common purpose of improving student learning. You can see there's close connections there to that definition around assessment literacy and um, us working together to have a better understanding of what the system should look like. Next slide, please. So within that infographic, within our system, we have four types of assessments that we focused on. And they're four commonly known. I think if you went to anywhere in the country in different school districts, you would hear common vocabulary being used. But it's been important for us as we've done this work to build vocabulary and understanding across the district. And so the four types of assessments we identified were formative, which informs instruction and in student learning. A subset, and we spent a lot of time on this conversation around progress monitoring tied to the MTSS or RTI process. Benchmark and interim assessments, which monitor student learning, and then summative assessments, which evaluate long-term learning. So if you will go to the next slide, you will see on this slide, there's examples of these types of assessments that we use in Academy District 20. So formative, which looks at instruction and student learning, this is where we might give student feedback. We have common assessments that are used across the district. That subset that really focuses on progress monitoring is a tool that um, Andy is Mrs. Rus Ms. Rusgen <laughs> um, will be sharing with us as well, um, which is Acadians and it was formerly known as Dibbles. A lot of us know that terminology a little bit better. And then the benchmark or the interim assessment is NWA map growth. And so that's what we as a district selected and are currently using. And then that summative piece, you look at CMAS, PSAT, long-term evaluation. It could be an end of year final, end of year semester final, when you think of high school and some of the finals there. So tonight we're gonna look at two specific assessments, NWA map growth, and then Acadians. So as I prepared for tonight, and we've been doing a lot of research and thinking around, oh, next slide, sorry. Um, <laughs> 
as we um, worked through the pandemic and thinking about data and information, I came across a great article that NWA had actually published, but they've been doing a lot of research nationally on student learning. And so they had put together some talking points that I just thought spoke very much to what we've been looking at as a district. So COVID has definitely changed the way we teach, the way we interact with um, families and our measure of academics. We probably don't truly understand the interruptions and their impact on learning, and it may be years before we see what that really looks like. The fall of 2020 provided sort of a data restart or a place to start longitudinal data. So when I say that, there's a couple places that happened is we see CMAS was paused, so we don't have that state data um, that we've always had in the past. And then for us as a district, another example would be NWA is a brand new assessment tool. So this fall, maybe not the best timing, but it is what it is. <laughs> um, we implemented that brand new assessment in the district that we had spent two years selecting. So we were excited about that part. Um, we know that we're going to um, continue focusing on making instructional and programmatic decisions. And so that's something in learning services in our schools and across the district, we're having all of those conversations. And then we may not know the impacts that we need to be that may need to be addressed that we can begin planning for. So some other considerations I've thought about as we look at specifically NWA data and Acadians data is at the beginning of the school year. So in the fall, when we did our first testing windows, we had 2600 students at Journey K-8 for the first time for our online school. In um, the winter window, so more January, February, when we tested, we had 1,600 students at Journey K-8. So you saw about 1,000 students across the district um, you know, move to different schools and different locations. We've seen many learning environments during these assessment windows. Kids are at home, kids are in school, kids are testing at home, kids are testing at school. Um, we've had a high number of guest teachers. Some of our children have seen three or four teachers within this fall period for them. And so consistency in the classroom has been a challenge. So those are just some things we want to consider and we think about when we're looking at the data. Next slide, please. So as I shared, after that two year program evaluation, we had put together an RFP or request for proposal process to select a new tool in the district because through that work, we knew we wanted something different. So NWA is the vendor. Map growth is the specific assessment that we are implementing in District 20. So some things to think about with this assessment is this assessment focuses on instructional level rather than mastery. So a lot of times we see assessments where they're looking to see have you mastered everything. This assessment is built so that the teacher knows what the child or the student is ready to learn next. So it is a different way of looking um, at assessments and providing information to teachers. So it gives them a place to start. It provides them information about the instructional level of the student, a roadmap of the steps the student could take to be successful and work toward mastery. But again, it's more about an instructional level than mastering those skills. Next slide, please. So NWA map growth, we are testing in ELA or reading and math that students typically see between 40 and 53 questions. And in a second, we'll look at it's an adaptive computer test, and that would be why students see different numbers of, of um, questions. It provides an overall score for the subject. So we get an overall score for math, an overall score for reading. Um, it provides goal area scores. So it'll break down reading into um, different categories so the teachers can narrow down that piece. And the average time for taking the test is about 50 minutes. We did see this fall, it was taking students a little bit longer because it's the first time they've taken it. The computer adaptive piece we'll talk about in a second is really challenging kids to find out where they'll top out. So some of our kids work so hard to find the answer that they spend too much time, they just need to go on. So part of that's the coaching we need to do with kids so that they understand there's gonna be questions that they may not know the answer to, and that's okay. Next slide, please. So in our district, we have tested two windows. We tested a fall window and a winter window. So the fall winter was August 24th, um, through September 23rd, and then the winter window was January 11th to February 5th, because we want to make sure that we're ensuring that we're norming and for all this data that we're doing it at the same time. So in our district, our expectation was for language arts, we would test grades four through nine, 
grade three was optional and that came because the state of Colorado July 1st changed the READ Act requirements on which assessments we could use because we had planned on using NWA for that. So small curveball. So we made third grade optional, though many of our schools chose to do third grade for their language arts kids as well. And then math grades three through nine. Spring has historically been optional in our district and it currently is the same for this year. So next slide, map growth is a computer adaptive test. So it adapts to the student's current level based on the student's responses. Um, it provides accurate data for the students at all different levels, so different grade levels, different levels of achievement, um, and it provides a RIT score. So we're going to talk about that in just a second. So next slide. So as I'm getting smarter myself around this new assessment, and this year NWA has provided a lot of the professional learning. So about three weeks ago, we did another round of professional learning so that we could all learn. And so it's we're using the assessment team, a lot of the learning services team. And then each school has two people. Um, it's usually a school assessment coordinator, and sometimes they have an assessment buddy um, who attends with them. So what we know is there's some unique um, data pieces and unique vocabulary to NWA. So first of all, they use a RIT score. So the simple way to think about a RIT score is that it's an equal interval. It's used to show growth over time and it's independent of grade levels. So you want to see that student score continuously increase from wherever they started. Um, so let's see, what else was I gonna say? Um, <laughs> let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Another piece is NWA does provide normative data. So these charts are overlaid here on the slide, but they give us fall, winter, and spring. So we can look to see what the expected score for that student would be. Um, and so that's our target for what our norm, our expectation for students. So next slide, please. So now we're gonna look at some data. And I will tell you, as of even today, I have been watching the informative videos, <laughs> getting smarter about all these different data points because we have so much more information on students than we historically had. So the test that would have been similar to this in the past was STAR from Renaissance Learning. And so it gave us a score one point in time, very much like CMAS, not a whole lot of details. This provides a classroom teacher all the way down to standards and the next thing a student would be ready to learn in ELA or math. So it really gives the teacher a ton more information than we're seeing here on these slides tonight. So a typical grade level summary report is what I kind of snipped here. I just, I made the chart for you that's on the slide. So we're looking at language arts reading for grades four through nine, even though third grade is on here, I just want us to keep in mind that not all schools tested third grade this year. So we have a fall writ score next to that RIT score for the um Mr. For the, can I just ask a quick question what's sure. RIT stand for RIT I know what does it stand for it's the Roush unit so Roush is a fancy man who invented <laughs> RIT stands for Roush unit yes because Roush... got it <laughs> enough said so what I've learned is we you just don't want to get caught in the details like we want to think big I'm like <laughs> There's a whole like 14 page packet we can read more about Mr. Roush. <laughs> Trust me, all I've done is like try, I'm like in between everything else trying to study up. Here. The I, the, it's, it's, I don't know if you pronounce it Roush or Rash, but the Rash unit is the R is Rash or Roush. Unit is the IT from unit. The end of the so I, that's, yes. yes. It's, it, it doesn't make, it doesn't help much, but that's really what it is. I don't think that's a point we should get hung up on. <laughs> like they just give us a red score. So, um, and I have a much longer uh, definition if we want to. Um. I'm not sure which was funnier, the, when he said, what is RIT and you say RIT, or he oh. Says, oh, or the sorry. Roush. I missed I, that I'm part. sorry, this both of those were quite humorous. Okay. I was like, what's RIT? I'm like, Rit. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that was not me being sarcastic, though you might have thought so. We have phrases in the aviation world that are similar, like A cars. Everybody is just, it means A cars, even though it's an abbreviation. Nobody knows what it stands for. Well, you just call it A cars. So I get it. I get it. Okay. We're just going to call this one Rit. Okay. <laughs> for right now. 
So when you think about a RIT score, it's an achievement score. So you're looking for what kids, you know, their achievement level. And so next to that RIT score for each um, grade level is the fall norm. So the norm is what the target you want the student to hit. And then you have the winter score for that grade level and the winter norm. And then the third to last column that says RIT change above it <laughs> is the difference or the observed growth for um, those grade levels. And so you want, what's important here, and it's kind of a good news story, it is a good news story, is that our students improved from fall to winter in all grade levels. Um, and in most cases, if you walk through from a RIT score, which is more um, achievement focused, we outperformed the norm. So the norm is looking at studies that they did um, around 2018, the norms were created. And um, I think about it in the sense that they were created before the pandemic, but if we could perform pretty well before the band, you know, other districts are struggling like we are right now too. Ms. Rams, if I may. I, <laughs> Ms. Sure. Yeah, go as we go, I just like to ask a couple. Yep. So the norm is, is not a target, it is an actual average. Is that a national average? Is that a state average? It's a national number that they've, so, so these taken, norms are simply national norms for fourth grade kids in taking this test in the fall. Right. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank so you. So it's the target of what you want to hit or be better than too. Well, I wouldn't call it a target. I, that's what I'm asking. A target's very different than a norm. A norm is simply an average, whether that's a horrible average well, or a great right. average. A well, target we is. We want to be better than average. So a lot of. So I think we're both saying the same thing. But yes. Okay. It's right. an it's an average. It's simply the data that comes out, what they are, whether it's it's good, bad, or indifferent. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we're feeling good. <laughs> well, better. Yeah, now here comes the scary part. Okay, so this is the part um, that's yes. a little more challenging for us. Um, so the last two columns, so NWA uses some interesting mathematical numbers and um, definitions. So they refer to, the last two columns refer to the school conditional growth percentile or the SCG, as I have noted, or the median conditional growth percentile. The far right column is what we're used to seeing. It's more of an equation when you look for growth like we see from CMAS or like what we use for teacher evaluation. So that's a closer calculation to that. That score is calculated by individual students. So it's using a median score. So that's similar to what we're looking at um, for, um, for like when you think of CMAS and the MGP scores that we've seen in the past. So I'm getting better at explaining this other one. So the, <laughs> the school conditional growth percentile puts students in grade levels on an equal scale. The score is typically lower because the grade level growth is harder to achieve. So when you think of the grade level, you're thinking of all kids and you're trying to move them forward. Where the one on the far right, you're looking at individual students, so you're going to see more growth and more change there. Okay, good. I see some nods. Feeling good about that. I just have to say this is so much different than the way that I read it. So I'm so glad to read through this because this chart did not make sense the way that you're saying well, it. You so I know oh, I'm like I've been staring. I'm like there's a lot more I could give you. No, but thank I you. thought we'd start with the no. basics. Okay. Yeah, let's start base. And can you're going to talk about the colors in a minute? Yes. Yeah, so okay. the colors. What I did is, and I'm not so sure I'm happy about this now. So remember, I'd just gone to training. <laughs> I'm building a board report that's due super early, and I'm getting smarter every day. So I color coded it based on um, how we look at CMAS scores, how we look at typical growth. So a 50 year higher being green. Did I lose my, who did I lose? You say you're getting better with colors? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about colors, I'm getting better. No. Well, he's color blind. It's not helping. So, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Mr. Lundberg doesn't see colors. I know, Mr. Okay. you know who taught me a lot about that is Mr. Maxson, Mr. Clark, yes? So we can we can do a better job for you. <laughs> <laughs> Just think left and right. So anything higher than a 50 is going to be green. You might have we might have to do something different there. And then anything lower than a 40, I went with formatting to show red because that was just a bigger drop and a bigger um, description. In the future, we might look at it a little differently as we get used to this data and we get used to looking at these reports because I will tell you I'm being very honest. It is all new to me as well. Can so I'm getting smarter with you. Yes, ma'am. The thing that is interesting to me about the way that you're saying this too is just that that the the ones on the left are the 
um, group versus the right being the individual. And I think knowing that would be very interesting to see that on, you know, on a on the chart that way. Anyway, I makes more sense. Thank no, you. About two o'clock today, I was like ready to give you a different report. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I okay. stayed the course. OK, so let's go to the next slide. And they're pretty mini on here, but they to me. Um, so the next slide shows little graphs. There's like a, a bar graph and a diamond. So the bar part of the graph is observed growth. So that's what um, that's where our students are performing. The diamond is the projected norm. So you really want and we want to see the, the diamond more within the purple than not. Mm. So when they look like candles would be my description <laughs> when they look like candles. That's not so good because we are not meeting the growth that they thought we would meet. So they set what they say is projected growth that we would achieve as a district. So if you look at grade four, we're not quite there. Grade five has a, a larger um, gap, but when you get to ninth grade, that diamond is starting to enter the purple. Ms. Reynolds? Yes. So if so, the before it was score, not growth. Now we're talking growth, which is different. Am I correct on right. that? Okay. Yes. So as I'm reading this, we didn't reach the observed growth on any of our grades. We got the closest we got was ninth grade, but it was still below. Right. Am I reading that right? Yep. It's within it's probably pretty darn close, like to visually see it. Yes. And and that is a that that the 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 grade level norms projected growth. Yep. That is simply a national average. No, so that's what they are predicting based on our students performance. This is where they would perform. So they make a prediction on where our students started in fall and where we would hope they would be in winter. It really speaks. It really speaks to COVID. Yeah. Yeah. So because even though they're learning in a in an in person classroom, this would look probably very different would be my guess. Uh, agreed. So okay. so even though our numbers in, improved, every one of them improved from fall to winter, they didn't improve Enough nearly enough right. as they should have. And when you as look at the, the as predicted. Sorry, Mr. Lundberg, the red more of the red numbers on the previous chart. So it'd be the, the left of the two right hand ones. Those are looking at individual students. So when you see those lower red numbers, that means we have more individual or more grade level students scoring lower. So that would make sense why the. Um, <laughs> they look more like candles. Did you have something? Oh. <laughs> Thanks for smiling, Mr. Lindbergh. OK, we're moving on to math now. Are we all good? Next slide. <laughs> so the good news is it's the same lesson we just practiced. So you're going to see writ for fall, writ for winter, also known as the Roush unit, and then your fall norms, your winter norms, and the rate of change again. So at a quick glance, you see that in math, we do have more um, higher scoring areas than we did for ELA. And then if we go to the next slide, we will be able to see the observed growth versus the projected growth. So remember, we want that diamond within the, the band as much as possible. So Joanne, um Um, looking at this, we talked about COVID under ELA, right? And then you look at this, and you'd say, well, shouldn't that carry over? Shouldn't you know? Shouldn't the same learning gaps, mastery, all those things manifest in this? So, why the difference? <laughs> That's a great question. So those are questions, and at the end here, we have a couple of questions that we've been asking ourselves as schools because. You're looking at the big picture piece of all of our students. The schools have reports that look like this about their school and then the classroom teacher and then the student. So that's really the work that has to be done. Um, and I can tell you that you know, like this week we've started to pull by ethnicity. We've started to pull by, you know, so there's so many other reports in there that we have to think about those pieces. Yeah. So I don't have all the answers so, on. Does, does all that data go into Tableau? So it does not currently. So this is a brand new system. Yeah. So we had to see the data, see how the reports come out to decide how to build the visualizations. But we have a ton of data within this report system 
that we never had with our previous system. Because I would think because of the individuality here right. so that produces, the Tableau piece would be important, yes. right? So it'll help with the score piece, but the other piece that, that this system provides is they have like student level reports. So you can put a report about JoLynn and all of her learning areas she needs to work on. It'll print it in groups of children. These five kids need to work on this. Am I not turned on? I'm still green. Um, so, you know, there's a lot more to be done. I, and we have to think about, like when you think about, we had 2,600 kids at the beginning of the year at Journey K-8, then they all dispersed, you know, 1,000 kids went different places. You know, there, there's a lot of things going on here. So I'm kind of looking forward to fall when we get to do this for the, you know, the third time with the whole district and get to see the data again, because right now it's kind of nice for the teachers too to say, this is a learning time. You know, right now this isn't being used for teacher evaluation. It's not being used, you know, but this is using being used to help us do a better job of serving our kids and understanding where their gaps are. Mrs. Cloninger, did you want to? Well, I was, at, when you were first talking about it, when Will was asking that question with the math and that being so different, I would think that it would be kind of reversed. Um, but regardless, uh, I started thinking, well, ninth grade, those kids are more able to work um, on their own um, as opposed to a third grade, but the third, but the elementary are in school. So then it, boggled my brain a little bit again so because I was thinking of right. them as all at home but they're not no but then you well, think about all the quarantines I mean just today one of my you know like yeah constantly kids coming and go you know like so but that's what I wonder about with the numbers as far as the littles being yep. in that more drastic piece where the older ones are able to kind of still do their work I don't know I don't know. And I think the, Andy's reading data is another yeah. piece to that, you know, because she has the K3 yeah. um, data for all of our schools as well. The other piece that, as you said that about ninth grade math is this is a grade level task, a test just like PSAT, SAT. So we're testing every ninth grader. So they could be taking algebra two as a ninth grader. So you could have some higher level math students, you know, mixed in there as well, which could make their scores a little bit higher. And these were tests done at home or if both? Both depending so, on where the student was. And you may have addressed it already, but what about cheating and things like that? I mean, so we've put protocols in place to use Microsoft Teams so that teachers can monitor their groups of students. Can things happen? Absolutely. Can they happen in person too? Absolutely. You know, so we've put preventive measures to the best we could. NWA had done a great job of preparing schools and districts over the summer. Now it was our first go, so we had the learning curve of it being brand new on top of a pandemic, on top of have remote. So it was a little challenging, but um, they had done a great job of putting materials together to support schools as we did that in a remote environment too. And I would just add that skill acquisition around language arts and math are very different. So it's difficult to compare them, particularly when you're talking about elementary level reading. It's just right. gonna look different than math. Um, and even the math scores aren't where we'd want them to be, the observed growth piece. I mean, right. we like that ninth grade one, but. <laughs> We don't like them looking like yeah. candles. That's right. Yes. That's right. Okay, so next slide. We should be on a slide at the top that says area of focus or areas of focus. So these are areas that I just pulled, you know, looking at the graphs that we had looked at, that at reading at the elementary and middle school levels, areas to target, math at grades five, six, and seven, area of relative strength that we just looked at is high school. Um, and there's a lot of different pieces that go into that. Um, and then we will continue assessing students next fall and winter. And so as uh, Mr. Gregory had said earlier, this, this tool and this information is so important to us now as a district because we don't know what state um, testing will look like this spring. I can tell you right now, parent opt-outs are looking higher rather than lower. So um, it's gonna be interesting to see what that data and those pieces look like as we go into um, spring testing. So, my last slide is looking ahead, so next slide. And when I shared a little bit ago about questions we're asking ourselves is how do we know students are growing academically and how do we know each student is making the appropriate level of growth? So we're looking across the district big picture, but when we've done this professional learning with our, our building leaders, they're looking at individual student growth and which kids do we need to address you know, more than we do other students. Do you think about that fitting into the MTSS processes as well and um, interventions in the classroom and teachers really being able to recognize what kids will need? 
So Sorry, that was the one thing that I was thinking of too as we went through all of this is what RTI is going to look like next year because in so many ways that just seems like a huge gap, you know, that yep. they're going to kids that weren't yeah, kids that weren't ever on that radar, you know, are now part of that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Speaking of my own. <laughs> Sir Gregory, were you trying to say something? Yeah, the, the, the good news is, though, that I'm trying to think of an analogy. So, so earlier today, we talked about what some of the schools are doing uh, this summer. We talked about one high school that was approaching um, their summer school possibly differently and that they weren't. I think the example I used was a student fails Algebra 1. Most of the time what happens is student retakes Algebra 1 from day one through the entire course that one of our sc high schools is looking at maybe that's not the best way to do it. Maybe uh, maybe we just have the students um, redo certain units or standards or wh whatever the, the school has defined. Uh, through this discussion is I think a lot of the questions can be answered in that down to this when, when Ms. Patterson talks about down to the student level, it's student level, but inside of that it's even down to uh, very specific elements. So as far as when we talk about RTI or MTSS or any of our responses to student learning, I think the information you get, well, I don't think, it's very obvious that the information you get from something like this is down to that level. So I, my answer would be it's going to be, from a planning standpoint, much easier to target uh, instruction to individual students learning because the data right here tells you uh, where the student is. I mean, we're not seeing that granularity on this, obviously, You're, but, no, but teachers would be able to see that level of 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 um, well, I don't know lack of progress or or whatever it is. But it but it can be focused. That's the difference, I think. And that yeah. uh, trying to you know guess at it or try to get at it through uh, CMAS obviously doesn't get get us to that level at all. That's the difference in the, the two difference between tests. the formative and the yes. summative assessment and yeah. the formative assessment is much more meaningful. But we give you different information, but this one even more so than the prior tests we were giving Absolutely. or assessments we were giving gives that level of detail where a teacher can when we're trying to design a response to to somebody's lack of learning, you can get right to kind of the target of it. Yeah, but I think of, I think of some of the parents that we've had come through here like um, you know, ones that have come in and talked about other districts that have been open the whole time and, and the growth that they've still been able to have. They've stayed on that trajectory that, you know, pre-COVID. And, um, you know, anyway, just just kids that haven't been on the radar. I, I get what you're saying that you can get to that point and know where they are, but they weren't in that, they weren't an issue before. COVID and this has changed that into the sense that now they are. That's where, do, does that make sense? Well, it, it does. I understand what you're saying, but growth is growth. So it, even if, if whether students in attendance or not, it can, we can project the growth and yeah. we can still look at those, those students. Yeah, so, I got you. Yeah. But yeah, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. All right. I'm going to turn the podium, if we're good for that, um, over to Andy Ruskin. Good evening. Hi, Andy. Hi, is my microphone working? Am I able Mark, to take sir, the mask off? Is that yes, okay? feel free. That'll be better. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for the opportunity to come and talk to you this evening. Um, certainly reading data is something that I'm passionate about, so I'm looking forward to digging into it a little bit deeper with you. Andy, I'm gonna stop you just for a second, give time for, we need the, the next presentation put up for the folks at home. Just, well, for the, the next slide. Oh, next slide. Next slide. Oh, there we go. Thank you. And I will actually kind of start speaking to the first blue slide. I know there's the slide that's up there right now says read act data. Now it's the next slide. Next slide. Are we on the blue one? There you go. Okay. Great. Um, all right. So the data I will be sharing on the following slide shows how kindergartners through third graders performing on the Acadiance Reading Assessment, or formerly known as Zibbles. I think my acronyms are a little bit easier than Jolene's. <laughs> and I'll start with, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run with it. So Dibbles, 
um, stands for Dynamic Indicators of Basic Early Literacy Skills. And it's been around for ages, so no new news here. Um, let's see, it's exciting actually that for the first time, every District 20 elementary school has chosen to participate in the State Early Literacy Assessment Tool Grant. Through that participation, um, we are provided with consistent and comprehensive um, assessment and view of the student data. So when looking at the following comparison report, um, there's a few things I just want you to keep in mind. Um, one is that the specific measures that are used and the target scores change each time the students take the test. So if you look at that table, um, that happens to be green. Um, you can see an example of kindergarten in the fall, which the fall assessment is taken um, in the first, the first month for first, second, and third graders. Kindergartners have two months to take the first assessment, knowing that really the first month of school for a kindergartner is not learning how to be a student. So they have a slightly larger window. During that fall measure, kindergartners take the first sound fluency assessment, and to meet grade level, they'd have to get a score of 10. In the winter, you can see that kindergartners take first sound fluency, phoneme segmentation fluency, and nonsense word fluency. So there's more assessments, and then you can also see, for example, the target score to be on grade level would be 30 for the first sound fluency. So you can see with the different grade levels that the actual subtests change a little bit, and the target scores will also change. All right, next slide, please. So here we can see how all kindergarten through third grade students perform now, mid-year, the MOY, that's middle of year, compared to the start of year, that's the boy, beginning of year. See, easy as um, so when comparing middle performance, middle year performance to beginning year performance, we, yeah, turn mine off. Hello? Hey, can I'm going to scoot it a little closer too. Oh, good. So you weren't cringing because of what I was saying. <laughs> Just how I found it. Well, that's I was actually right. feeling bad for you, Andy. I thought if she thinks these facial opinions. <laughs> like no. I'm barely into it, folks. <laughs> You're doing great. You're doing great, Andy. OK. Back to, all right, so we're looking at the overall K3 um, achievement data. So really, um, what we want to note is that we do see 6% more students at middle of year are at or above grade level than at the beginning of the year. Um, that's not a drastic change, um, but what we want to keep in mind is that that means that students did make enough growth to stay in the same, you know, as the test became more rigorous and the scores, the target scores became more rigorous, um, they were able to stay in the same category and a few made some growth. Um, at this time, we're not able to pull desegregated subgroup reports, but we are working with our IT department and our ELAT um, team, and I'm optimistic that we'll be able to access this data in the future for our subgroups, so we're excited about that. And did you know how that compares, and if you don't, it's okay, but how that compares to like last year, the kind of growth we would have seen in the past? Maybe last year's a bad choice, but maybe the year before. <laughs> um, I do actually, so in a few slides. Is that coming? I'm sorry. No, that's a good okay. question, because that's the first thing that comes to many of our minds, right? So um, next slide, please. We'll dig a little deeper into that overall data. So this next slide looks at specifically at kindergarten and first grade. So you can see that while kindergartners aren't losing ground, they're not really gaining ground either. Um, in contrast, and this is something that I'm going to refer to again, um, we can see that our first graders have shown significant improvements, um, certainly compared to our other grade levels. So um, overall, our first graders improved 23 percent 
Um, so you can see that right side of the bar, the blue and the green grew. Next slide, please. Our second and third graders look much like our kindergarten. Um, students are really growing only enough to kind of match the rigor, the increased rigor, but the gaps aren't, they're not widening, but they're also not closing at this time. Next slide, please. So we want to dig a little deeper. Um, so we're going to look at the same data, but from a different lens. And this, this report, I'm going to orient you to a little bit. So this report is looking at specific students and how those specific students change from the fall test to the winter test. So you can see the report is broken into four columns or what I like to call buckets. So we have our well below bucket on the left. So all students that scored well below were put into the red bucket, that well below bucket. Then we have our below column. So all students that in the fall scored below are in that bucket. Then we have our at benchmark or on level group. And finally on the right are are above students. So all students who scored above in the fall were put into this column. And then the colored bar um, kind of in the middle of that screenshot shows how those st same students performed in winter. So some highlights um, from this, you can see if you look at that well below column, that about a third of students who scored well below did jump to another category, either below or at, or some even move to above. The below students, you can see that about half of those students have moved to on level or above level, although we did see some slip as well. So some it's 125 students um, slipped into the well below category. Um, so you can see um, the comment at the bottom of that slide. Overall, 3,618 students increased their achievement or remained at or above level. Um, in contrast, 1,423 students either decreased or remained below or well below. So that's the overall K-3 data. Next slide, please. Oh, Ms. Reynolds. Yes. If we, it just, yes, if we go back, I couldn't figure out how you got to 1423. Where, where did you get that number? OK, so. I, I, but no, but below no, or well go, below would be ahead, yellow Ms. or Ruskin. red. Yeah. But the, the numbers add up to way more than 1423, so that's why I couldn't figure out how you got that number. So some of them, so they either slipped back. So in this calculation um, would be if you look in the advanced column, so that would include the 16 kids that fell all the way to well below, um, 78 students who fell to um, below. It wouldn't include the 347. Understand. If you add up all the reds and yellows on the bottom, mm -hmm. which is what I thought it would be, it's way more than 1423. So I didn't include, um, actually it's. Yeah, but what below or well below it says, that's yellow or red. I know, but the ones that are already below. I, they should have been included, the seven. Is it not back on That slipped. So what. It's not. We we can move on. I, I apologize. If no, no, that's I'll okay. I was just puzzled. I'm like, where did we get those? I thought I understood it, and then the numbers didn't add up. But, but let's let's press. We can worry okay. about those numbers later. Thank you. Okay, I will look into that. Thank you. All right. So if we look at kindergarten and first grade, um, here's where you'll see some differences between kindergarten and first. So um, happily. If you look at our well below students in both kindergarten and first grade, we moved about half of those students out of well below into either below or above that. Um, you see, start seeing a bigger difference when you look at that second column of students who at the beginning of the year scored below. Um, there's much more movement in the first grade group. Um, it's about two thirds of the first graders that did move out of below. Whereas when you look at the kindergartners, it was maybe a third. Um, and then again, looking at those students who were at level, we did see more slip 
in kindergarten versus first grade. Um, although a few students moved to advanced, but if you look at the first grade students who were on level, a good portion over half moved to advanced. So first grade, um, that's where that that larger growth and improvement um, is also reflected in this area. Any thoughts or questions you'd like to address on this slide? OK, next slide, please. Looking at second and third grade, um, they really almost mirror each other and they look much like kindergarten. Um, I think most notable for me when I consider this data is that the fewest kids moved from this well below section. So when we look at our red students, only a small portion of students moved from well below into a higher level. And we had students that were below that slipped into that red quadrant. So that's certainly an area that we will need to be focusing on. Um, you know, with initial um, digging into the data and looking more closely at schools, two significant contributions um, we feel led to this. One is that based on the concerning first grade data that we saw at the very start of the year, we made intentional decisions in school to really flood our first grade classrooms, um, to be intentional about staffing if we had staff move because of um, COVID and, and difficulties there. We really flooded first grade with support. So the good news in that is that we saw results from that. Um, the tricky part is that because of cohorting, um, those folks that we put with our first grade classrooms to support were unable to support other grade levels as, as usual. Um, schools worked really hard to not mix different grade levels and kids in different groups. So um, the attention that went to first grade unfortunately was pulled from other grade levels. And then we also just know and have seen that remote learning for well below students in second and third grade is um, more challenging because for second and third graders who are remote learning and read well below level, it's more difficult for them to access grade level materials without additional support. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit more in a few slides about what we're doing about that. Next slide, please. So to address Ms. Reynolds' question and probably um, a question that most of you have is how does this data compare to previous years? So we did pull data specifically around the winter benchmark and where our students were in the past two years. So in 1819, at the winter benchmark, we had 821 students who were below or well below. In 1920, we had 825 students that were below or well below. This year, we have 1,951 students that are below. Um, so certainly a big difference. We also did a little more digging and we wanted to look at just the fall because it was a question, you know, what did that fourth quarter, how did that impact our start data? So I'll read this. Actually, both in 1819 and 1920, we started the school year with about 1,200 students that were below or well below. Um, 1819 was 1237 and 1920 was 1286. This year at the start of the year, we had 2,112 students that were below or well below. So it's certainly that fourth quarter and we know certainly for our kindergartners going into first grade, I know that was the focus for many of us. Um, there were many students that really lost learning that fourth quarter when they weren't in school. So it is clear that remote learning, quarantines, cohorting, um, and just the current realities of school have impacted teaching and learning. Next slide, please. All right, so what I like to say is good news. So I, I like to think from need comes in innovation. So um, we are working hard as schools to be innovative and to start addressing this need now. So on your slide, there are some bullets that have quotes from um, principals around the district and what they're doing in their schools. 
um, really one of the things that um, many schools are doing are looking at that cohorting as our level on the dial changes. We're making really intentional um, changes to our cohorts to allow for more intervention among more students in need. We're also tapping into additional resources, including student teachers and our inductees. So our inductees, um, new teachers to the district um, with their provisional license are tutoring our students and seeing much success. We're restructuring the day. So even if we can't restructure our cohort, um, schools are restructuring their day so they can increase time devoted to reading instruction. And we are also starting before and after school tutoring programs at our elementary schools. Um, we also continue to partner with our parents. Data is shared with parents and MTSS. So anytime we um, start intervention with students, an MTSS plan is written and shared and built collaborative, collaboratively with parents. And certainly read plans um, are shared with and built with parents. There's actually a section and it talks about school responsibilities, student responsibilities and parent responsibilities. So they continue to be our um, reliable partners in addressing student needs. Next slide, please. I'm also very excited to be developing our summer reading clinic. So this is in addition to our summer enrichment program for elementary students. Um, we will be utilizing ESSER funds and um, Currently, your slide says 16. We have a new school on board, so we're at 17 elementary schools that are exploring and developing um, in-person um, tutoring programs to be conducted at their schools this summer. Most schools are aiming for two three-week sessions. They'll be targeting those students who are in primary grades and below um, or well below in reading. And for our district um, centralized program, We've decided to offer virtual tutoring. Um, the reason for this is that schools that aren't electing to do their own, um, part of that choice is that parents have historically had a problem getting to their buildings and participating. So our hope is that we'll be able to allow more access to families and students. We're also able to um, offer sessions outside of a typical Day. So we're hoping to offer tutoring sessions in the evening, possibly Saturdays, but it will be an opportunity for both teachers and students to access and will be consistent. So being virtual, we won't have to worry about quarantines or delays um, and we'll be able to provide that consistent support. So um, we aren't necessarily surprised by the data, um, although we're happy to have it and we're happy to use it to make um, really intentional decisions and my biggest um, I guess celebration is that I think we can see with that intentional um, instruction and support of first grade students it really does make a difference so we know we have the capability and now it's just about getting innovative and making sure we're giving kids what they need what other questions Mr. Tempe can I answer so Andy, I, I like seeing the summer reading clinic, you know, the proactive approach and hopefully parents get on board with that too to optimize the uh, involvement. But, you know, looking at the the number and again, we we anticipated it for microcosmic to a national, probably international scene here in terms mm -hmm. of mastery and all. Um, this is a multi year issue, you know, uh, I'm sure the school administrators are, are strapping this on and, and trying to figure out what they can do in the year for the year. And they may not catch up for a while. This may not get resolved in terms of mastering where people should be the next year and possibly the next. So this this pandemic is a speed bump, it really is. Ms. Cloninger. The other piece of that is, and I was thinking about this with first grade because when I've worked in schools in that grade that grade typically shows the most growth you know like as far as going from quite you know babyish to really little students um and so i would expect that growth in there no matter what uh, i i agree it's it's hopeful and and it's good to see but i anyway i wonder if the stuff that we will 
have ongoing will um, affect specific grades more than others. I kind of think inevitably because there's, you know, certain things where you see like a third degree, you know, third grade reading or, you know, just different benchmarks that may follow that group of kids for quite a few years in different ways. You know what I mean? I do, agreed. And I think that fourth and fifth grade and sixth grade teachers are probably going to see deficits that they're not used to. And to support those teachers in learning how to fill foundational phonemic awareness, phonological awareness components for their older students is going to be key as well. And that, I think I was, I agree. I think that's why I was saying RTI. I, it might not be really meaning RTI <laughs> the way that, I, we've had so many acronyms and I'm getting too tired, but my point is, is that that's, that's what I was trying to say is that, you know, there's things that will have to be adapted that we have not had to, you know, deal yeah. with. And yeah. so anyway, well, response to intervention strategies we've had have been put on. Right. I hear you. That's what I'm trying to say. Thank you. Kids aren't there. You can't do them. Right. I understand. Anybody else? Yes. Mr. LaValle. Yeah, I've got, I've got several more questions. Yes. First, Big picture, I want to thank you all for doing this. I know it's new. I know we're all sort of trying to understand this together and I appreciate it. You know, when I think about what's important, what's the crux of, of what we do as a school, ENDS 1.1, ENDS 1.2. This is ENDS 1.1, knowledge and skills. And so this this is so crucial. That's why I know I know we all feel that way, but I, I just, it's so important to, to, to understand that. And I'll tell you where the blame goes. The blame goes to the virus ultimately back to China, but we won't go there. So we are going to do what we can. I mean, it, it, in other words, we're not blaming you. We're, we're, but so we, we have this problem that was put on us. And now how do we how do we get out of it? And so we're all working together to try to do that. And I, I appreciate that. That's what we need to that's what we need to continue to do. So uh, I just wanted to say that. Um, what about 10th, 11th and 12th graders? Yeah. Microphone. Mic up. Mark knows that's why he gave me the lavalier because I'm not very good at standing still. No. Um. <laughs> um. So for 10th, 11th, and 12th grade students that are on plans, or if the schools had concerns, they did test on NWA as well. We just didn't um blanket those because we typically have PSAT, SAT, um, and historically in the district we haven't. It is something that we've talked about looking toward next year. Is it something where we might want to um, you know, add additional grade levels? Okay. Um, Can I ask one quick question? Please. Just, are you saying NWEA? Yes. Okay, it sounds like NWA. Well, and I, I realized. Sorry, know. you should have told me to take my mask off. I didn't even realize I wore it the whole time. I'm so used to sorry, having a glued to my face. Sorry, I just wanted face. to know if we were saying the same N -W -E -A, thing. NWEA. Yes. You're just saying it really fast. Okay. Probably. I'm just rolling it right off my tongue. <laughs> Mr. Valley, <laughs> please continue. Okay. Uh, who, okay, back to. Just a couple of real quick questions on NWEA testing. Um, is this relatively new? Has it been around forever? We just haven't used it's it. It's been around for a long time. Um, districts probably historically change tools, you know, probably every five to 10 years. Um, so we did a two year process of evaluating and coming up with a list of what we needed from the tool. We put out the RFP with a group of stakeholders and we felt like this tool was the best match for the district because of the additional information we get at the instructional level for kids because okay. the score only gets you so far. You know, the teachers really wanted help around where, where is the student and what do I need to do next? And when you talked about the fact that, you know, um, Journey K had 2,600 kids and knew what the 1,600, but those 1,000 kids, we still tracked unless they left the district, right. right? So we were still able to say, okay, Johnny or Susie went to, to this different school, but we still tracked them from fault. Okay. Uh, yep. They moved. It's just they've had a teacher change, a school change. You know, they've had a lot of um, additional things to think about. Right. Right. Um, so real quick, if the kids stayed in the red on the formerly known as Dibbles, Acadi Acadian, whatever that's Acadians. called, Acadians. Um, so if, if a child went from fall, win, uh, fall to winter and they stayed in the red, red is, is, is measuring growth, am I right? Or is it measuring achievement for, for Acadians? Achievement. Achievement. So if they, all right. All right, so if they could have grown just a little bit, but enough to kick them. Okay, so it's not because growth, you know, you have to have a certain amount just to stay there. Okay, so that's achievement. The other, and, and NWEA is, is growth. 
Okay. Okay. Um, NWA it, well, it, on NWA is more of an achievement for right. when they demonstrate growth. So when you think about growth, you think about how much did a child lose in, the, in a year or from fall to winter. So you're looking at a distance of time. Cadence is looking at just how did the kids perform in fall and then how did they compare in winter and put them um, in a spot um, that they performed at. Okay. Um, just a couple more and then I'm done. Um, Do we have any idea of those 1,951 kids who are well or below or well below? Any idea about free and reduced lunch? What percentage of them? My, my, my big fear for this whole COVID, th one of my many fears, I should say, is that you know, we've, done, we've worked so hard to, to close the achievement gap. And my fear is that those, I'll call them upper middle class kids for lack of a better term, they're going to they're gonna do okay but the FRL kids are going to fall even further behind. Do you have any evidence to, to, to dispel that or support it? You know, so we we aim to have a disaggregated report based on, on that criteria. What I do know is when I look um, at our Title I schools versus not. That's a good, yep. We, we actually see some mixed performance. So it's not that our, our Title I schools all dropped, um, you know, by more than our non title one schools. So really it's it's not consistent based on that marker. Um, some of our title one schools grew a lot and performed maybe not so high, but um, some both grew and performed. Good. Relatively high. OK, yeah. that, that that's a good news story in, in my mind. Yeah. Um, so sure. um, and then thank you for talking about parents and, and that's the and it's just so important. When I think of, especially for young kids, not not as much for older. When I think about these first, second, third, maybe fourth graders, just man, if, if parents just read to those kids at, at home consistently, um, and again, th that's a tough nut to crack. How do we how do we encourage those parents? How do we help those parents to do that? You know, and I when I used to read it at Doug Valley, shouldn't do this, but I'd always say, hey, do your parents read to you? And inevitably, the answer would be no. I'd say, tell your parents to read to you, and you read to your parents, and I. I just try to encourage, but it's hard. I get it, and and but but I'm I'm pontificating. Anyways, <laughs> thank you. I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Lavalley. I the way you looked at some of those scores is how I look at budget sometimes. I just want you to know that. So I get it. Um, anybody else have comments or questions? I have a an observation, um, or not? I don't know. Maybe it's a question. This I'm going to look look at the read data particularly, read act data particularly the Acadians, but did students at home take these tests too or was it just because I know NWEA they did but is that true so in person and at home they we did have some students take it on home so the doubles assessment though is given one-on-one -on -one with the teacher so if students were at home they had a team's meeting set up they had the material in okay. front of them electronically so it it was at home, but it was still very much a one-on-one -on -one test. Okay. So I think that's less of a variable. Sure, and I wasn't really worried about the cheating piece as much as I'm wondering about, do the students that are engaged in online learning engage in this testing as well as those are in a classroom? Do parents do it? And and if not, I mean, that's rather rhetorical. I'm just really trying to get to all the variables that are out there. So do, do parents engage their students in the process? So if we're doing, a, if I'm a Journey K-8 student, right? I may decide I'm never going to take that test, right? That has nothing to do with where, where, what I'm really trying to get at is next year when we look at this data, it's not going to look a whole lot better. Or the next year, I'm going to bet. that That's my projection because we how many students do we have we lost now? About 1,000. They're not even engaging, perhaps, perhaps in an educational experience. So what's going to happen is they're going to come in and take tests and they're going to make those numbers look weird again. So it's a variable that we have to remember as we go along. Is that fair? OK. I have a story that might illustrate sure. what you're talking about. So Probably I was. Probably better than I did. <laughs> um, well, I was fortunate. I was able to proctor um, an iReady assessment with first graders at the beginning of the year. Um, and so I sat on my side of teams and I watched them take their tests on their computer. One little girl was on her mom's bed <laughs> mm -hmm. and at one point was like jumping over her sure. computer. Yeah. And I was like, you know what, why don't you go grab something to eat, come back. <laughs> Another student I gave yeah. <laughs> at Proctor the test to, her mom was sitting on the floor 
just at a view of the camera, Chris, I saw her head pop up from time to time and was, you know, right there for, it took two hours oh. to have the same. So yeah. I would say the variables are yeah. great. Yeah. And so we're going to look at that no matter what we do for the next year or so. Uh, so a lot of variables. It will be interesting to see, to compare the data, of course, going forward, and then to have numbers alongside them of how many students came back who weren't engaged in schooling at all. How many of them are kindergarten kids who could have been first grade kids? That's a lot of data, but it'll be interesting to see that. And I also say regarding secondary or high school students, I would think it would be interesting to see the difference in scoring on AP and IB test, IB tests. I understand that those are high achieving students, but I'm going to bet that looks a little different too. Um, than they have in the past. The, sorry, one last thing that I was thinking too was the, um, <clears throat> and I don't know if you have any idea of this, maybe with the end of the open enrollment stuff of if kids are going to be repeating, you know, because we have, we think a lot of missing kindergartners, but then we see these kindergarten scores where they've stayed at, you know, little to no growth. And I kind of wonder um, if that's going to be bigger than normal. I don't know. Um, you go to the mic, Julie. Um, in learning services, we've had that conversation a lot, and I think at this point we're really working to put interventions and MTSS processes in place because kids that need to be retained is usually a very different situation. Right. We have a Don't great like opportunity in front of us to move these kids forward and catch them up and fill those gaps that they might be missing. Okay. Um, so we're, you know, Maureen, would you agree that? Would you say? Oh, that's. Oh, I forgot. Sorry, Andy. Not my time. <laughs> I can tell you so far, I've had two conversations about parents wanting to retain. retain. Oh, okay. I just wondered. Not that many. Yeah, it's not, not something we like to do much, but yeah. Right. So I had a conversation with um, board presidents. Uh, Casby facilitated a lunchtime meeting with board presidents, and the question on the table was, "What are we doing across the state around learning loss?" And um, it was very interesting to listen to them. And I said, we're investigating what ours looks like currently. So thank you for this report tonight because it gave me some data. And I appreciate the next steps because I'm making sure that this is a problem across the state and uh, a lot of conversation about what are we doing differently. So thank you for that tonight. Anybody else have comments or questions around any of that? I would, to, to I would say just one thing. We, we talked about this summer. Um, I know that you know, when, when I think somebody, Andy, somebody said they were applying for ESSER money, uh, they're applying through Miss Allen, right? <laughs> it's not like they're applying somewhere else. They're, they're applying through Miss Allen. And, and part of this is uh, the second round of ESSER dollars. There's a little bit more flexity, flexibility on the deadline. It's not, if you remember that the first round was a there was one of them that was December 31st of 2020, right? It was really short. Uh, this uh, most recent round has a couple years. Uh, so the, 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 yeah, so September 2023, um, that offers, you know, opportunities, not just this summer. What we're trying to do is also put into some of this financial planning next summer. Somebody had said earlier, this is not a, a short term problem. Um, it's it's probably going to be more than just a three week session in the summer, and everything's good and we move on. Um, so, you know that's that's part of the planning too, and that doesn't include whatever may come out of this. What's going on right now? Uh, you know the the debate over the one point trillion dollar one point nine uh, trillion dollar package package and what what goes to schools from that. That's not even a part of any of this discussion yet. So there may be opportunities also. And Andy, if you could just address costs for this summer. I didn't bring my cost sheet. I'm a reading girl. No. Um, cost to, cost to students. Remember. Sorry, cost to students. Oh, oh, that number I know, that would be none. That's zero dollars and zero cents to students. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. Well, th th <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mrs. Pedersen, Mrs. Ruskin, and Mrs. Link for being here tonight. Nice job.
Going to move to um, agenda item number 14A is the Board of Education discretionary budget for fiscal year 2021-2022. Mr. Lavalley. Thank you, Ms. Reynolds. Um, get my notes here. Um, so this is the discretionary budget, and I, I I I feel bad about beating the discretionary horse, but remember, I didn't even know there was more than I, I thought it was just the budget. There is non-discretionary which is certain fixed election costs that we have every every other year, assuming there's an election, which is about 60,000. And then the board secretary uh, salary and benefits. Those are non-discretionary. This is discretionary. I'll just be brief. Um, the, um, the I'll just briefly talk about the changes. Um, the the profession training and professional learning was zero this year, and then next year is going to be 2000. This is the um, sort of the virtual if you recall on our quarterly budget it was it was the um uh, the virtual training that we did that that were that that finance wanted to track so it sort of we just moved it if you will from the travel and conference registration up into this into this um into this call uh, this row um, the next one training and conf uh, travel and conference registration you're going to say wow look at that we more than doubled that's amazing Except when you look at the previous year, it was $25,000. And then we went down to 11 at the modification because we weren't going to use it. And now we're going, if you will, back to a more normal amount of 25, 23, but th there's that other 2,000. So that's where it's coming from. I, I have hopes that we will attend the NASB. I, let me rephrase. I, I have hopes that there will be a NASB convention. And if so, I have hopes that we will attend said NASB convention. Have they canceled it already? They already canceled this year. Yeah. It's virtual. It's virtual. That's right. But perhaps the following year, which this would still be in that budget. So this would be like next. Is it April that we go? Tuesday, April. April. Yeah. So that's what that changes. And then, of course, election supplies. This is the discretionary part of elections, which is something that Katrina does. For instance, you may recall you need, I think, 50 signatures and she goes to the county and pays money to get names so she can verify that those those people are in D20. That's an example of some of those election supplies that are that are discretionary, but but they're not, but they're occurring um, this year and they didn't occur last year. So those are the changes and are there any questions? I don't see any, Mr. Lavalley. Thank you. Thank nice you. Report. Discretionary is something we think about each time we look at our budget now. So thank you, Mr. Lavalley. I'm going to go on to agenda item B, GP 4.13, cost of governance discussion about Board of Education request for policy language change. And that's Mr. Lundberg and Mr. Lavalley. Thank you. The, the changes here are basically word changes. There's no concept change but there is clarification on the wording. Uh, some of the, this is the way it's done. It's the first part is what it says now. The second part shows the changes and the third part shows the cleanup without the red and blue or green or whatever it is. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention in particular to the middle of this number two where it says board and then it has the color discretionary underlying budget. As you remember, we've had the discussions on what is a board budget, what is a board discretionary budget, and I think most people have agreed that uh, our budget is discretionary, the one, the one that we work with, and therefore the words should be appropriately said in that respect. Uh, there's a little bit of cleanup on the Board of Educational Budget. This budget will include and then a little bit more specificity on the words such as uh, A and C, E, F, G, H like that. Uh, it's a nice cleanup of what we have. There's no substantial change though to what we're doing. We're just being more definitive so that people when they read it will understand it potentially better. Mr. LaValle, do you have any other comments on this one? 
it, thank you. you. You said it well. I, I would just add these these A through I. I'm just simply we're trying to simply match the the quarterly discretionary budget that you see every quarter. We're trying to th those are the same rows as here, so we're trying to, to to true those up, if you will. And then on the back side, and um, you know we're just we struggled a little bit, I think, with number four. It, it was initially <laughs> discretionary fund guidelines, and then we just change it to budget guidelines, just board budget guidelines. And it it was hard to figure it out, but this is what we have. We are we are open to if you all say I don't like this, by all means we can change it. We um, it, it it's it, it it is not easy to we 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 wrestle with this trying to figure out the word verbiage, but that's the verbiage that we came up with. Even the discretionary fund on number four, at the very beginning, we oh, okay, we changed the budget, and then we talked about discretionary underneath. So, um, there you have it. Mr. Mr. Tempe, Tempe is. Uh, do you have a comment? Smirking. Please, <laughs> I, I value your opinion. I think we need to beat this to death. I know it's not very important. I was going to say it, discretionary. It, see. So, um, as I'm looking at this and our previous presentation. I'm, do these listed categories tie exactly to the listed categories on the proposed 21-22 budget? Yeah, that's a great question. You may have noticed that today a couple of those were tweaked, right? Number C was yeah. printing and binding. We changed it to printing and copying. And also D was travel, and I ch we changed it to travel slash conference registration. I did that exactly because when I looked at this, proposed budget, I saw that it was different. And I even I sent a, a note to Katrina and I said, hey, there's three things to look at. There's this quarterly budget that we see. There's GP 4.13 and then there's the annual one that we're going to look at and approve. They should all be the same. And they're almost the same. There was a couple little ones on the annual one that we that, that we're going to vote on. They I will say there's added commentary. Um, and I got to I got to find those, um, but yeah, I would just suggest that they're congruous. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree. I think they are now. Well, I think there's just a couple of subtle differences because you had separated out some of the virtual attendance from the conference attendance. And so just uh, again, we don't need to beat this to death. No, it's just for posterity's sake. Uh, that we should have those exactly listed as they're listed on our upcoming budget as proposed. I agree. That was going to be my comment. I, 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 you're preaching to the choir here. So the, the, the annual budget, the one we just looked at, for instance, purchase services, this one says professional slash purchase services. I, I don't know why that the main one says just purchase service. I don't. Yeah, that and, and then I, I know it's semantic. Yeah, it, and then it, it's just for consistency's sake. Yep. You know, when we're all gone. So which one is it that we should change? Well, I just think whatever Tom presented for the proposed budget for next year, I think is good. It's clean. It's 14 explainable. A. Yeah, mm -hmm. that should be translated into here. I agree. And just those bullet points should correlate exactly to those titles. Maybe we can pull this off and bring back a clean copy next time. Um, for, for for the actual budget, for the actual policy revisions you've made. Yep. yep. So because we bring them both back for votes next time, resolutions, they could be in the consent agenda as long as they reflected. So to good, be good. Straight, that, that's right? the intent is making yeah, as long as point. we're in agreement okay. that they're consistent documents. That's all. Right. I, I agree. And yep. and let me let me just throw this out. The 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 one we we we're gonna. The annual small point, it doesn't say miscellaneous under general supplies, and I think it should. I liked that I liked miscellaneous and it wasn't on here and I, I decided I didn't want to bug Katrina, but 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 we should. Uh, general supplies slash miscellaneous. So that's yeah. I was I tell you, Will has caught me off guard a little bit when I went, crap, these aren't these don't line up either. Yeah. And I confess I looked at it yesterday really closely and I and I saw exactly what you saw on I me. Mean, no, but you guys did a good job looking at the intent and all that stuff. Yeah. So right. We just need to align them. And yeah, that's the only Miss thing. Adad has something she wanted to say. Yeah. So I just want to I just want to confirm that we want it to match the the, the updated 
policy. What, no, so what if we, we did we this? Want what Tom presented as next year's 14A. proposed so budget. You want what he just presented. Those categories on that proposed budget should be reflected in this document. In the, revi in the revised yeah. GP 4.13. So, so based on the proposed budget, not on the updated words. Like, right. That's right. So I copy, I copy what is on the proposed budget. Yes. Yes, into the policy. Into the policy. But I'd yes. like to see general supplies slash miscellaneous because I think that yeah, adds. Yeah, if you want to change the proposed budget line proposed item budget. to be reflective so, of that. Yeah. So we should reflect the updated language then. Let, let me throw this out. What if, I know, forgive me. What if the three of us got together again and it came up with the best of all of these and made that the same in GP 4.13? That's the fine. The annual budget and the quarterly budget. Yeah, that sounds fine. Same. And let's bring it back for consent unless you feel like it needs discussion because we, I think we all are in agreement. We just want them to align. We don't care what yeah. they align with. Yeah. Right. Good. Okay. okay. I mean, preferably each other, but. All right. Any other, any other comments about GP 4.13? So that will be brought back to when do you think our next board meeting in consent? Is that fair? Maybe, oh yes, because we need to have it by then because Katrina needs to be a part of that discussion. She's heard it. Okay. Anybody else on that one? Thank you, Mr. Lavalley, Mr. Lundberg. Okay. I, th <laughs> um, I think we're, I think we've had it. We're what, almost 10 hours in? I don't know. Okay. So we're going to move to item 15 and that's our debrief. Was our business this evening focused on activities that promote and honor our mission statement, our belief statements, and our global end statement. That reminds us that all students will have the knowledge, skills, and character necessary for a successful transition to the next level, and upon graduation will be fully prepared for success. I'm seeing nods and hearing yeses, so this meeting is adjourned.